Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's once again Friday night. So, of course, as I always say, you know what that means. It's time for a bit of nostalgia. It's time for a wee dip into the archives. And tonight, it's a little bit of past and present because we are talking about a player who is still very much active in the Celtic squad. It is the captain himself, El Capitano, Callum McGregor. Because a few weeks ago, obviously, we did the one on Brendan Rodgers because now he's back as manager. Last week, we did one on the uh, connection with the City Group because, hey, that transfer window's open right now and that's very relevant. So I thought, let's keep it with some relevant topics to what's going on at Celtic right now. So by all means, go looking at the career he's had so far and the career that he's still got to come as well. I think it makes perfect sense that we take a wee look at uh, Callum McGregor, what he's achieved so far and just how great a player he is. The whole celebration of Callum Mac tonight, guys. And as you can see, tonight's time-travelling team We've got Russell on Bustalja this week. Um, how you doing, my man? Yes, very well, Phil. Love the Sunday name. Appreciate it, mate. The Russell bus is the Russ bus. Fuck that, man. <laughs> Fuck. See, see, like I don't even mind my first name. My first name's alright. See when folk call me Russ or Rusty. Russ. I'm like, I get that in the fucking bin. There's a reason <laughs> even my mum calls me Boyce because my first name's shite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. My mum, by the way, does call me Russell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to, good to see you, mate. Good to see you, and uh, glad to have you on again. As you can see below us here, uh, yeah, Liam's not able to make it tonight. So Canada's favourite Tim, he's off to a meeting this afternoon. So stepping in, first time mm-hmm. in about over a week, because we ain't seen you in a wee while, Steve-o, but uh, welcome back on, mate. It's good to see you. Uh, how you doing, my man? All right, mate. Hi. I've been uh, I've been away, so I've just I've been struggling a little. I've been a lot done in, mate, but... I'm uh, up my it, and then I'll be away again. So I thought oh, I'll come in some away and hold the next week. So I'll be away for a good 10, 12 days. So nice. happy to get involved. Off anywhere nice. Recharging the batteries, mate. Recharging the batteries. Yeah, See, that's a I'm, new holiday. That's but, a new yeah, holiday. Yeah, 12 days. Mate, so hmm. wait, wait to spend next week. So nice. I'm about time away and get myself sorted. I said, I've just been a bit run down lately, mate. A bit tired and mm. stuff. A uh, couple yeah. of... A bit of health woes, but I'm all right, mate. Uh, so, so I'm glad to be back. This doesn't get you through, mate, but now always picked people up. I because I probably look like fucking hanging, so... <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't worry about that. You're on nurse. Uh, <laughs> You're on nurse. Uh, I was going to say, though, I was going to say a 12-day holiday. That's a real holiday. Do you know what I mean? What about Terry Robb? He just takes three months off in the summer. He just fucks off for three months. Where is Terry yeah. Robb? There's a few people who have been the comments in chats recently of our shows saying, get Terry back on. When's he coming back? Demand it, for Terry's there. It's part of his contract. He just he just works <laughs> through the season. He's like he's like that Clyde One presenter. Do you know what I mean? When he just like he does every weekend, right? Throughout mm-hmm. the season. In the summer, he just fucks off for two months. That's what Terry <laughs> does. It's part of his contract. It's not me trying to keep Terry off the channel. But I, I, I much prefer Steve O's idea of a 12, 14 day break. That that's fair. Mm-hmm. But I you know, some folk are divas, some folk are they? <laughs> well, I'm sure Terry will be back in due course anyway. Once PMP fires up for the new season, he will be back. The voice and the face of old PMP, because he's, uh, as I say, plenty of people in the chat over the last few weeks have been calling for his return, but it will, it will be coming soon, folks. Don't worry about that. And uh, yeah, so before we get started, obviously, uh, obviously I have to remind everyone to do all that good stuff as usual. So, of course, uh, my Remember to hit the like button. It does us a huge favour uh, in terms of the old algorithms on YouTube. It puts us in more people's recommended videos and helps us get a bit of traction. In fact, any interaction is good. Of course, you can hit that subscribe button to keep us in your life that little bit longer if you haven't done it yet. We are 68 subscribers away from 4,000. God, when this channel started, people said it might not even get 400. But here we are, Russell. We are heading towards four. Thousand. So, yes, yeah, 68 away from uh, 4K, so 68 more people. So, of course, if you haven't done it yet, hit that subscribe button and help us on the road to 4K. And, of course, get involved in the comment section tonight. And, by all means, share the link of the Boise Bus on social media, uh, any platform you wish, including the new one, Freds, which I haven't actually um, indulged in yet. Because, I mean, Twitter's a dumpster fire right now, and it's pretty much dying out, but... Can I even be bothered starting a new social media website at this stage? I don't even I don't know. know what this is. Fred's is uh, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, answer to Elon Musk going on Twitter. He's basically yep. it's, it's basically Twitter. 
again, just under a new name and a new owner. Um, yeah, he, the, uh, what's his face? Elon Musk has already got a cease and desist order out. Try to sue him. So billionaires at war already. There you go. Oh, I don't know. Who knows, man? Rumors, not, no, I think apparently they might be. There's not but a UFC fight. You're not talking about a cage thought, fight. Well, they're fighting anyway, I think. Like, I know it was meant to be a spoof at first, but apparently it's happening. Well, they're fighting in the courtroom, it seems, right now, anyway. So there you go. Mm. But yes, if you want to share us on threads, Twitter, Facebook, any of those sort of things, then please do so. That'd be great. And, of course, you can check out our sponsors, piesports.com. Of course, remember to get that tasty discount of 12.5% off using Bus1888 before this guy down here gets all those kebab pies. Get in there. Get them. <laughs> he, is, uh, he is all over them. Um, and, yeah, with all that being done and said, we got a quick trivia, guys. we got a CalMac related trivia to get the brain going to start the show. We'll come back to the answers at the end. I think it would be rude not to. So, yes, Cal McGregor. Tonight's question has seven answers to it, guys. And it's Cal McGregor has a very impressive 100% winning record in cup finals for Celtic. Who's the seven teams that he's got winners' medals against in cup finals? There you go. And that is that is tonight's question on Cal Mac. Because, yeah, see, tonight it's all about the captain. So let's get into it, guys. Let's talk about him. Uh, so, obviously, just a wee bit of a, you know, basic facts about Cal McGregor. He was born on the 14th of June, 1993. Of course, he's now 38 years old. And, uh, yeah, as we know, he was at Celtic from 2001. He actually joined in the youth, the youth main, one of the many youth teams, whatever level it would have been at that point. But, yeah, he uh, has been at the club since 2001. Incredible. When I actually looked that up, I was like, I can't believe he's been around that long. So, I mean, you're talking Larson and that were all about at that time when Callum McGregor was down there in the youth team, the, the you know, the, the kids' teams. Uh, so he has been part of the furniture, essentially, and has played at pretty much every level that you can, coming all the way up. Until 2013, when obviously he was able to go out on loan to Notts County, and as it's been well said many, many times, he was on loan with one Jack Grealish, who not too long ago was the most expensive player in British football. Not bad company to keep, although I don't necessarily agree that Jack Grealish should have been the most expensive player at one point, but hey, that's just English football and uh, EPL tax for you. <laughs> Jack Grealish is cool, mate. Oh, I, don't, I, don't deb- I don't debate. He'd like, be giving it well, do Jack Grealish is a fucking banger. Oh, no, he conflicts the answers already. No, he's fucking just like, he parties the right way. What Carl does is that. He's certainly does that. I love it. <laughs> oh, love the they're all like, oh, you can't really do that. How can you not? We get steaming, son. Enjoy yourself. Love him. Oh, really, I, I like the soft roll down look as well. The hair band's not so much, but I get it. But no, I don't um I don't debate any of that. I just say player wise, do I think he's a hundred million pound player? Who has a hundred million pound player these days? It's just EPL tax, it's just the way football's went. We've talked about that many yeah, times in the last couple of weeks with the Saudi Arabian stuff and all that. <laughs> it's just football nowadays. But yes, not too long ago he was. And uh, yeah, he shared the park with uh Callum McGregor for a full season at Notts County on loan. And McGregor did no too bad in that loan. He was a, had 37 appearances. He scored 12 goals from midfield. However, did you know, guys, that while he was there, he would cross paths with one Brendan Rodgers and Steven Gerrard? Because in a game in the League Cup against Liverpool, with Liverpool 2 0 up in the game and Notts County got it back to 2 2 before Liverpool eventually won the game 4 2 in extra time. Brendan Rodgers was the manager of Liverpool for that game and Steven Gerrard was on the park playing in the midfield against Callum McGregor in said game. <laughs> so their paths have crossed even before they did with, uh, when Brendan Rodgers came in as Celtic manager. But yeah, back in the 2013-14 season, that was the first time Brendan got his eyes on this uh, young player, Callum McGregor. Who knew the way fate would turn out? Eh? Funny old game, as we always say. Uh, is, but is yeah, Callum McGregor one of the scorers No. He wasn't one of the scorers, sadly. That would have been unbelievable. Oh, that would have been quite incredible. That would have been unbelievable. But even that, that's surreal how the, the swings and roundabouts, nature of it all. Wow. It is, it is. But then, of course, he did get his chance in the Celtic first team in 2014. I've about to remember hearing stories about this this youngster from the reserve team that had, had quite a decent loan spell in the English lower leagues, Callum McGregor. It's a name that I've been doing around, especially if, obviously, if you play champ manager. And stuff like that, you know, you'll be accustomed at that time to like the Celtic reserve team. You know the name Callum McGregor and one of these players. You promote him to the, the first team and he does develop into a good player. But then in real life, you see it happen. But yeah, Ronnie Dyla comes in, obviously, as a manager, and decides to give him a chance. And of course, Steve, we uh, know how the, the massive impact that he made because he scored 
In his first three away European games for the club, he scored away against Reykjavik. He has scored away against Legia Warsaw. Uh, enough tie that we try to forget. And uh, UEFA actually helped us to forget by erasing it from existence. And then obviously he scored against Maribor, which is another one we try to forget as well, because despite Callum McGregor's best efforts in those three qualifying games, we still managed to blow it. But what a way, Steve, to land on, the, you know, to land on people's radar. This youngster coming in in the first three European qualifiers we play had some scores in every one of the away games. I, you know... It's weird that uh, it's going to sound strange tonight. Like, Cal McGregor for me is a player that I didn't really bother with him, if that makes sense. It's much similar to the, when we done the Forest one. Mm-hmm. I probably don't. I'd probably say like you know he was a decent player. If I was being completely frank and honest, I don't think mm-hmm. I really cared too much about Cal McGregor mm-hmm. to maybe Brendan Rodgers' first season, end of the first Aye. season. Then neither here nor there to me. Do you know what I mean? Like he was on loan, you were like, whatever, cool. Um, a lot of folk will disagree with that, but you know, it was just I, I don't know if it was because you had guys at Scott Brown and stuff that were bigger personalities, mm-hmm. it just kind of blended into the background. And I don't really think that for me until sort of I played a, a more focused role under Roger's team and then largely when he's been the captain and he's been the figurehead that you've really or at least I've Paid a lot more attention to him and appreciated what he does a wee bit more. Aye. Um, I, I, you know, at those early stages, I just thought he was another guy that he could have could have moved on and, and mm. he probably wouldn't have noticed anything. But Aye. gladly he kept him about and he was obviously positive and Aye. came on. Well, look where he is now. Do you know what I mean? Oh, big time, I know. But as he was always a bit mad that you know you, the first three games, you know, the first three away games in Europe, he was a good bet for first goal scorer at that point. If you were, if you enjoyed a wee mm. flutter at the bookies, you probably got quite good odds on this lad. But it was like a weird phenomenon. I mean, the one that obviously is the biggest kicker because the Warsaw game was such a weird anomaly of what yeah. happened. We we did obviously get beat and then a weird admin error, just the craziest <laughs> of admin errors, put his foot in the next round. But it's the Maribor game after that. Uh, and again, McGregor scores out there, early goal, gets us an away goal, and then uh, in the second, well, we end up um, drawing, was it 1-1 in um, Slovenia? And then, yeah, we come back to Celtic Park and we just blow it. But then, of course, he did start dom- the domestic season, and he actually scored in his uh, domestic debut as well. Uh, he scored against St. Johnston in the opening game, um, beating them 3-0 up at McDermott Park. He scored there. So, yeah, he was on What game was that? That was in 2014, 2014-15. Yeah, we had to play our first um a first uh, game of the, the league season away because Celtic Park was getting used for the Commonwealth Games. Uh so mm. we started the season up at McDermott. But yeah, we beat them 3-0. Yeah. McGregor scores in that. So yeah, he scored in three qualifying games. He scored obviously in the the first league game of the season. And we've not got an amazing track record at that point in time of bringing through youngsters. So what were you feeling at that point where you're like, well, this lad has clearly started with a bang. It can't start much better for him. Were you like, and obviously with hindsight being twenty twenty, and we know how what he's went on to do. But at the time, yeah. could you even envision that, like, what we what no. we had on our hands? No, definitely not. Because even if we started with a bang, that that era was so underwhelming in terms of the actual level of ability of the players. Anyone mm-hmm. even doing well, they probably didn't get the credibility anyway because it just didn't feel like this was a Celtic team. Do you know what I mean? Like, it just felt like this is. A strange phase that we're in right now where the, the, the mm. level ain't all that good. I've actually got a Facebook post. You know, you get the memories once, yeah, a, yeah. once a year, right? So there's one I've got and it's fucking, it's fu- honestly, I, there's a reason I don't share it. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I'll just share it on, on, on tonight because I don't mind taking the piss of myself on mm-hmm. the bus. But on Facebook, do I fuck shit? <laughs> it must be 2015. It must be 2015 before Rogers came in and it's Armstrong. And McGregor, two rabbits in the headlights, neither of them will make it. <laughs> but, no, you see, that's, that's fair, though. When, you know, that, that's, at that point in time, point time, that's fair. At that I mean, point in time, it was how I felt like just when you look back, though, Steve, when you go, yeah. yeah, one's on like 50 grand a week in the EPL, or maybe not this season. Yeah. But do you know what I mean? Scoring goals down for, you know, a lot of goals in English Premier League for midfield. The other one's now one of Celtic's most trophy-leading players ever, now getting compared as maybe ahead of Paul McStay, and I'm like, Aye. I'm looking at him going, I for a player, boys? 
nah, they'll not cut it. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's how you look at young guys, and, and particularly when they come through. And as you say, it's a, it's an example of the time that we were in, which is, comes back to what I said a couple of minutes ago. It was what it was, you know. Like it wasn't too hard to look great at that sort of particular era when he was coming through. And how many young guys have we seen that have burst into a team that have had a good few good performances, scored some goals, looked apart, mm. and then just faded away? So, you know, you obviously have that sort of cynical side to you with these guys. And and obviously, as they're bedding in and they have these sort of rope, some ropey performance and stuff, I do you know what people probably do, judge them a lot quicker than I do. And then there's obviously the homegrown sort of tax on that where, yeah. you know, we spoke about guys not getting a chance because they're not... Sexy or fashionable names, you know what I mean? So, nah, that's listen, that's just the way it goes. I think it's, it's natural for folk to think like that. It's, it's funny now, funny, but it's funny, it is though, because it pops up every year and I refuse to delete it. I just, it's just a wee reminder that you know fuck all about football, boys. So just a wee reminder every time you get a wee bit giddy with your silly wee bus, you know, there's a wee reminder that comes every year going, shut up, you wee blonde haired midget, just shut up. Nobody cares. <laughs> you fucking don't have a clue. <laughs> they were staring in plain sight, and all you did was say they were shite. <laughs> we've, we've all been there, mate. I've got ones that pop up on my Facebook memories and on. I'm just like, what was I thinking of that? What was I honestly thinking? But here's a quick, a quick question for you. It's just a wee test I want to do because with hindsight and revisionism, a lot of people talk about you know Cal Mack's first season and how you know he was great and the numbers he put up and Ronnie giving him a chance and all that. How many goals do you think he scored in his first season? I'll six. say, I was going to say, I was going to meet in the middle, so I'll just say seven. I was going to say about six. Oh, he's one the far away, to be fair. I was wondering if you were going to fall into the trap of saying it was in double figures, but um, no. No, he only scored, only scored five goals in the first season. But a lot of people no, are like, oh, are, are, are we banging and then Aye. drop off? That's what players yeah. do. First three, the first three qualifiers, the away legs, and then he scored against... Because he was a rabbit in the headlights, I told you. <laughs> St. Johnston, and he scored against Ross County in about November of that year, and uh, that was it. But with a lot of, let's say, hindsight revision, a lot of fans have this idea that McGregor came in under Dyla in the first season and was out, not out of the team for the rest of the season, was unbelievable. And it's like, his numbers were kind of... They weren't the superb. He started with a bang, yeah. and people remember that. But afterwards... He sort of faded out, and when we bought Stuart Armstrong in the January window, he did kind of. There's a other rabbit in the headlights, boys say, but uh, yeah, uh, he just kind of found his way to team. Brown obviously being the captain and stuff like that. So yeah, and Beaton was still getting regular games at that point under Ronnie. So McGregor was kind of in and out, but yeah, a lot of people I've noticed over the years have talked about ah, how great he was under Ronnie. Ronnie giving him his chance, and it's like he was good at the very, very start under Ronnie, and then just kind of faded into the background. And um, with the second season, when many things started to go wrong under Ronnie, with that team just kind of falling apart, again, his numbers weren't superb. He scored six goals for the full season, scored against Dundee United early on. Probably his highlight, his best moment of the season was a brilliant goal against Ajax in the Europa League tie that we still managed to lose stupidly because in the last couple of minutes, I think we were one each chasing a winner. And Scott Allen gets caught on the ball, dwelling on the ball takes too long. Ajax just take it off him and just break up the park and end up beating us 2-1. But early in the night, Callum McGregor had put us ahead to a really nice finish with his right foot, bent it into the far corner from outside the area. But yeah, unfortunately, he's also one of the players that missed a penalty in yeah, that that's penalty right. shootout. Yes, that one that we tried to not talk Scott about. Allen. Mm-hmm. No. Scott Allen. Scott Allen, I genuinely thought would have went on to better things at this point than Callum McGregor. That is my honest opinion. I know it was a noise up signing the 250 grand because <sighs> they couldn't afford 250 grand up front. But I thought that guy's a baller, man. Like, there's a reason he was selected. Was it West Brom signed him from Dundee United? He'd, he'd only played 20 games for Dundee United. He was 18. But we'd see, oh, oh, he'll fucking cruise it, man. Like, he will do well in this team. As I say, the standard of Celtic at this point was a lot of a lower bar as well. Um, mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I think I, I definitely. I, more visions of Scott Allen doing better things maybe at that time than Cal McGregor, to be honest. Cal McGregor, that awful mohawk too. And Scott Allen always yep. just, you know, I was like, he's a wee bit prettier, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm having him. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, you know, I still feel we signed Scott Allen to stop Rangers for signing him. I genuinely well, think well, I was annoyed that I was signing him. Yeah, but see, we actually awful. thought, ability-wise, though, he could, like, he definitely, there was something about him that didn't fit the 
the whatever the the puzzle was that that, that uh, Ronnie Dyla had, because he definitely at that point in time, ability wise, was a match for a lot of the guys, if not better than a lot of the guys that were getting game time in that awful Celtic team. Do you know what I mean? That was an awful team. And is that is that not just speak volumes of the state that we were in at that time? Because I mean, let's mm. be honest, right? Again, file under young guy that shows promise and then's muck. Like, yeah. You know, if we're being honest, like mm. the league was rat shit competitive levels. Mm. Scott Allen looked good in a shit league and then played <laughs> at Celtic, which was largely a shit Celtic. He was still, in the championship. <laughs> Ah, Actually, I had in the championship. He was in this league. He was in the worst. He was in the league league below. So So then, what take it as you find it, you know? But but I'm interested to see as as this night goes on with how many goals Cal McGregor actually scored because six goals, as you said, and then six Mm. and six. You know, that still seems like quite a lot of goals and, you know, for what he is. And when 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 you cast back your mind, you think... Or at least when I was getting ready for the night, you think he scored more goals back then, did he not? And obviously it's That's not a lot. It's more than it's probably more than now, do you know what I mean? So I, oh no, it's, it's just mind playing tricks on I was like, I was sure as well, because again, you hear people talk about how good he was, how Dial gave him a chance, he was great, and it's like it's not exactly how it panned out. But of course, luckily, after Ronnie Dial had left, now now we see the real Carl McGregor come to the forefront because that manager who crossed his path just a couple of years before in that League Cup game that I spoke about, he's now got a chance to manage him because Brendan Rodgers came in as the Celtic manager, of course, the summer of 2016, and everything changed. A lot of players who were there who looked pretty much done and dusted on the scrap heap, who could have left and nobody would have batted an eyelid. Suddenly a load of them found levels they didn't even know they had. Carl McGregor being one of them, obviously he slotted in there. And that team alongside Scott Brown in uh, the 4 2 3 1 formation that Brendan Rogers loved so much. Um, but yeah, this is when we start to see Callum McGregor, you know, just uh, evolving into the player of what he is now. And uh, yeah, some of the performances. I mean, the first one that always comes to my mind when I think of the Invincible Treble season and I think of moments that Cal Mack had. I think of the semi final against Rangers in the Scottish Cup. And that goal where he passes it so delicately into the net, Boise, and it makes that that really satisfying noise that the goal frame makes as the ball hits it. Yeah, that just, voice, you know that? Oh, there it is. There's the ball. <laughs> 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 it's fucking poor, eh? <laughs> oh, like, Scott Allen's like, ah, how am I not getting a game in here? Look at me with my wee curtains. You know what I mean? That was my That leaned towards Scott wee, Allen's. Like, looks like a wee goggly eyed gecko and all. And it was young guy. I think Cal oh, McGregor like getting put forward for those modeling shoots has to stop as well, lads. To be honest, I mean, <laughs> like he did look like he was wearing like he's like getting like. Do you know what the vibe I got was? Do you remember the very viral photo of Andy Murray wearing his Christmas jumper? Yes, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. what he looked like in that long sleeve Celtic top. Eh? But I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Just <laughs> get him on. He's done it. He's done his time, right? Like, look, don't put him forward for that anymore. There'll be young guys who. are Choking to do that for their Instagram and stuff. Cal, Cal McGregor's like, ah, fuck off with this shit, mate. Fuck off. Uh, he looked particularly miserable in that long-sleeved version of the new shot. Very miserable indeed. <laughs> I, just don't, I don't like the photo shoots as his back, is it? No. Like, yeah, no I'm no, glad though he's not got that mohawk anymore, because that was fucking dreadful. Oh, that was dreadful. That really was. It I doesn't totally go with that. It's like someone like is listening to the multi crew, like once just going, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, but me, um, listening to Wonderwall once. Is it worse than life. Scott Brown's early haircut, though? But, oh, no, he was like, he looked like something from fucking... Mullet on, like, a German, he was journey south or something, something, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know what he was going for. Uh, I would say, I No, that was bad. They were like, Hibs were like a boy band back then, weren't they? It was like they were all like... Yeah. Like the five main players were all like... They just looked like they could just like quit football and become a wee boy band. A wee mm-hmm. East Life. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, East Leaf indeed. The, the, oh, just mm. me, the, they were they were a mental crew that lot. They really were. That's something. <laughs> I mean, we signed a few of them as well. To be fair, so uh, we've ke- these names have came up a few times in previous episodes, like Riordan and stuff like that. Yes, oh. but yeah, Madman. Um, but yeah, in terms of say McGregor, I'm sort of the um the semi final goal. The the planet because the way obviously Hamden is with the 50-50 split, obviously when you're 
in the stadium itself and a goal happens to the other end, or sometimes there's a wee bit of a delay for some of the fans because you're that far away. But just that goal, Lustig, long ball up the park, Dembele's control, just taking it down and weighs it into the path of McGregor. And uh, just the way he finishes it, boys. I see it's that noise that the net makes or the goal frame that holds up the net, just that click and it mm. echoes around the stadium. Then you get the mm. roar from the Celtic end. Just one of the most like aesthetically pleasing goals I think I've seen in modern mm. day Celtic. He became he became a, a player though, I think, that was extremely calm in front of goal for a period under mm-hmm. under Rogers. I think it maybe see putting him in penalty duties. Can he missed a few? I wonder if that's played a, a factor. And him being a wee bit gun shy now, do you know what I mean? Not that you'll know much about that, Steve. Uh, but like, I think in general, he's finishing. He used to just be like, he just used to pass the ball in the net all the time. And I think he was very, mm. very ice cold in front of going. Now, I don't know. I think the, the penalty misses have played a part in him. Maybe just he's a wee bit. There's a quite often throughout a season, the last couple of years, there's been opportunities where the fans are shouting, shoot, when he's got the ball yes. inside the box and he doesn't. And I think rewind four or five years and he already has hit the shot and he just placed it nicely into the side of I the I think line. he only does I think he only shoots when it's probably desperate now, like the late winner yeah. of Aberdeen. But it was like right. there's no choice, yeah. fuck it, I need to try and take this on. Mm. Um because if you notice a lot of his goals that he scores, they, they seem to be maybe I'd say more opportune than than previously. Where it was mm. where it was almost like it was part of the play. And Correct. finishing off a move, whereas now it's more sort of like oh, I'm in a position. Fuck it, I'm going to hit up. It's slightly different. Mm-hmm. I wonder if this played a part. I'm talking about what you were saying there, boy. Say about you know how he just passes the ball in the net and how he became so calm in front of goal. Earlier in that season, we had a Champions League game against uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach away from home, where we got a one each draw with Dembele had scored a penalty. Quite late the on. Late on, he had a chance to win it, and he sort of snatched at it and cut it a bit too fine, and it was like a wee bit more composure, a wee bit calmer than you look later in the season. That finish, there was also the game at Ibrox, where we scudded them 5-1, and he passes into the net. He's got it on the edge of the area. I can't remember Mm -hmm. who the the Rangers defender is. It's in front of him. Try to block him. It goes through his legs, doesn't it? It goes through his legs, but he just passes into the the park wall. He's something like, oh, McGregor's... He's missed his chance or something, and then the defender turns side on and puts it through his legs. Aye, you see the, the change from the start or early in the season, that Champions League miss boy City, like how he was more composed. And since I wonder if that was maybe Brendan Bogwim on things like that and saying, you know, because I see that's a great example of as people talk about that Champions yeah, League. That moment. miss was bad, by the way, as well. I, 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 do you know what? But this, please trust me, this is a loving for Cal McGregor. But just for a wee bit of balance to the debate, I think he got away or got off with that miss lighter than. James Forrest. That's a great example, though. James Forrest misses that, and it's shite bag, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you know, probably a rabbit in the headlights. Probably a Facebook post about it. But I, do you know what I mean? I think, <laughs> but I do think he got like he kind of he didn't get the heat the same way. I think, I find I think a lot of players would. Is that fair? I would agree with that. I. I think so. Forrest has always had a hard, no matter how well Forrest plays, and this is the season that Forrest came to the sort of like the peak of his powers. But I, you're right. Forrest would get a totally different, um, a different, you know, reaction if he missed that chance. I reckon you're right on that one. He did seem to get off lightly because I mean, even like Patrick saying here in the chat, Mister Sitter in Germany. It was. It was. We don't all composure. That's when it mattered as well, which again is one of the things that you associate with Callum McGregor is when it matters. He actually fucking mm-hmm. steps up. I think that's one of his best traits. I think the more pressure he's under, the actually, the more he shines. I think the better the players he's either playing against or playing with, the better he shines. Mm-hmm. I think you know, for Scotland, for example, you put him with Billy Gilmore, who's I think a fantastic footballer, albeit he's it, it, hot and cold right now. Yeah, He'll develop like he will definitely become a fantastic midfielder. McTominay, I think, is a brilliant player. I mm-hmm. think the more he's playing around these guys, the more he's like, fucking give me that ball. And undeniably, in my opinion, and Steve Clark's incredible start to the, the, the qualifying group, McGregor's Scotland's best midfielder. Make no bones about it. McTominay mm-hmm. can have the five goals. Callum McGregor is the best midfielder in that team. And I do believe that's keep rise, raising the bar, he keeps meeting it. And I think they mentioned Gladbach, Borussia München, Gladbach <laughs> in Germany, in München, in Gladbach. Um, I, that was maybe just a moment... 
that 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 goes against mm-hmm. the norm for for yeah. Kermack, To be fair, aye, it was um to say just a just a deer in the headlights moment. Just panicked, you know, a wee bit more composure. But as I say that season, he comes on leaps and bounds. Although funny enough, his goal tally only goes up by one. So in his first season, he had five. Second season, he had six. He's got seven in this one. And again, in my mind, I'm like. I thought he was better. I thought he reached double figures, but he did play 46 games that season in all competitions. So the that number of games his, is going up last, significantly. His last part-time season. Ah, I would say so. That's actually part-time numbers for McGregor <laughs> nowadays. Like, that's that's right. what he was like. That was him just finishing off his part-time apprenticeship. Do you know what I mean? Before he really kicked on. <laughs> oh, big time. I, you know, 46 is a rookie numbers for him, as I call him the Duracell bunny at times on here, because he does, he just keeps going and going. There was generally points for during his career where I was like, he's going to break down eventually. Like, he can't he sustain this 60 games in a calendar year and all that. I was like, what's he doing? It's absolutely madness. But yeah, 46 games. So he has gone up significantly in terms of his game time. But yeah, seven goals, but some big ones along the way. Let's say the ones against Rangers. And of course, we can't even forget the 5 1 at Ibrox, say where we passed it. And then it turns out it was Tavernier that he nutmegged, you know, Hall of Famer, Captain Taff getting nutmegged. It turned out it was actually him that got pegged on that goal as well in the 5 1. But the season, I think, that is his, his best one in terms of numbers, where he played 55 games and scored 12 goals and winning three trophies again, because of course he'd won the treble in 16 17, makes it back to back trebles. And of course, he would go on to become, I believe, his only player. In world football that's got five trebles to his name, um, which is astounding. But yeah, treble number two, the double treble 17 18. I say probably in terms of like numbers, um, McGregor's best. Uh, and of course, we had a Champions League night again, going back to that, where he did put the ball in the net against a German team this time, one of the best moments in recent years. And then sadly, Celtic do what Celtic do best, Steve in Europe, and they do something really stupid, really calamitous because that night. We gave away a stupid goal to start the game, you know, a ridiculous one with a bad back pass that got intercepted. But the game, the way it panned out, we were all over Bayern. They were pinned in. It was building like, you know, a volcano ready to explode. And when McGregor does score, you feel like we're going to go and win this. We're, we're the only, we are the team that are going to go and win this game. We're the team in the ascendancy. But of course, Celtic did what Celtic <laughs> normally do in Europe and shot themselves right in the foot. And a minute later, they were a goal down. But nevertheless, it was a hell of a moment, Steve. It was fantastic when McGregor did just slot that one away. Something he should ah. have done a year before. He's doing he's your side as well. So you got to enjoy it. And That's true. I actually, I, I, no, do you know what? It's, it's a great goal. And, and obviously, you, you remember the celebration as well. And it's, you know, you know, he moves away and everybody's going absolutely mental. And then she says, I just, oh, God, <laughs> almost instantaneously. Mm, we're back to where we are. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a really good finish as well. It's you know, it's it, 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 and again, we, he's under pressure. Aye, he's under pressure when he slides it away. Do you know what I mean? And just say that it's a, it's a big chance. You know, in that game we have some chances, but it, it's the first sort of real. You know, you were on the ascendancy, and you, the goal comes, and you think, "Oh, we're going to make it better than that." And then, aye, aye, it doesn't pan out the way we wanted to go, but uh, definitely so, not. James Forrest did very well in that goal. I remember him weaving in from the wing and uh, beat a few defenders and just played into McGregor's path. But yeah, typical Celtic in Europe. But yeah, overall, that season was probably his best for the, the numbers he put out. But one game, it's of course... It's kind of like Carl McGregor celebration where he, 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 he always looks surprised that he scored, doesn't he? Yeah, like, yeah, he does. Like, oh, I've scored against Van Muni. <laughs> he does that wee scream as well, doesn't he? Come on! <laughs> yeah, it's so funny the way he runs away after he scores. Come on! Every picture I think I've used for the, the thumbnail, he's doing that come on thing in the celebration, yeah. every one of them. Ah, it's always really high pitch. It reminds me, like, it's like if Jonathan could play for Celtic for one day and he scored, I, I think that's what Jonathan would sound like. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> what was who was it again? Oh, it was the the guy for the the Corries that sings the national anthem for Scotland games. Come on! Come on! Come on! Ronnie Brown. <laughs> Come on! Come on! Those octaves are he's he can't go that low. He's no. quite high pitch. He doesn't. He's always like, "Come on!" I, like, I wish the camera, might, like the camera, mic didn't pick that up. Come on! Yeah. Like, overdubbed it with like Triple H doing it or something. Do you know what I mean? Because like, that's just a wee bit cringy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just a bit. Uh, like that's what I expected Jamesy Forrest to sound like. He's like, come on. 
<laughs> it could have been better if it was, um, would you call it doing it? McCarthy done it. Oh, come on, Russell, <laughs> give us it. McCarthy. Well, you know, a couple of games here and there, you know. <laughs> come on, oh, oh come brilliant. on. I went blind today. I bet they're just talking like a parcel tongue or something to them. Do you know what I mean? It was like, oh. who the fuck did they just say to each other? Yeah, a couple of games, and you know, don't worry, we do the tactics and all that. You'll be different human being and you know, here and there. <laughs> After the that's a well. I know. What the hell is that? It's his face before it though. It's like it's a bet. I've convinced, like it's an in joke because he scrunches up his face like, oh, a couple of games. I'm like, why is he even doing that face? What's brother? Oh, a couple of games here and there. I'm like, what are you doing? Someone's <laughs> on the wind up. He's like, I'm getting twenty five grand a week to play for Celtic. What do you want me to do at the presser? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, go do your best Brendan you're good at the Brendan impression James he's like I'm good at that eh I'll fucking do it the presser for a laugh he's like much I'm like fuck off you're not 25 grand a week aye right you're fair enough I'll do it <laughs> oh man was, uh, that, when it became reality that Brendan was going to become manager again that was one of the things that crossed my eyes. I was like What's going to happen when him and James McCarthy meet after that weird impression McCarthy seemed to do of Brendan Rogers when he joined? I was like, did he really talk like that? So, seeing some of the pictures in the training together, I just wondering, just, what's going just on? Just hanging together, right? Yeah, just hanging just about, hanging right? together. Right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that just, uh, it's a funny one, eh? Oh, Brendan, does that sound like you? You're still not getting a game, son. <laughs> 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 oh, the wee, the wee, uh, resurrection of James McCarthy's coming. Just keep your eye on it. It's coming this season. Oh, but see, um, when we uh, go back to the yeah, the 2017-18 season with that one, with the Cal McGregor's moments, 5-0 against Rangers, that is obviously one that stands out, the 5-0. Now, we've brought this up before, it's been said many times, but yeah, Russell, they definitely slowed down that day, and I still don't understand to this day why. We went 5 0 up after about 50 minutes, yep. and then we just seemed to just pass the ball around. And it was like, we should just go for the go for the record here. You know, we could have absolutely put like nine or ten past them that day. But I McGregor does get in the score sheet that day. Um, and yeah, of course, he also scores in the cup final at the end of the season as well against Motherwell to secure the, the double treble. But that particular new balance kit that's regarded as probably the best one in new balance either but we usually i think of that kit mcgregor's one of the first people that always comes to mind since you do think your kit you've always got like a player right away that you always see in it and that one with the gold daffabet sponsor and gold badge for some reason i always see mcgregor's like one of the first ones that comes to mind mm -hmm. um just for i guess just some of the celebrations that i've seen in it because he scores the one against Rangers in the 4-0 semi-final as well and he does the celebration, he runs over at the camera and Kieran Tierney comes over and does that at the camera as well, but it's just that again, seeing that shot, I just always think of McGregor's celebrations, first and foremost for some reason in that one, but it was his best season, I think, in terms of some of the moments he put out and uh, his numbers showed that Sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, 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 come in. Hey, I, I agree. I think it's when away, man. I didn't, I didn't know if you. Were, no, I thought it was. I thought I've spoken off, man. I'm sitting there. I'm just sitting there working on <laughs> my next impression for Scott. Uh, but no, I thought uh, Kalmak in that season. I think that's when he came of age. I think yeah. fucking, it's, you know, now, now sounds biased as fuck, but because he's back in situ, well, that's the Brendan effect. Undeniable, he turned Kalmak from what would potentially be a good player that Ronnie Dyle has seen. A good solid midfielder for us, someone that would go on and make be a, be a good squad player, maybe start 20 games a season, 25 games a season. Brendan turned him into, you know, an animal of a player for us. Do you know what I mean? And I mean that in the in I know he's not the Scott Brown sort of psyche, but Cal McGregor just seemed like a man possessed at that point. The bigger the occasion again, as I go back to the hand in goals as you're talking about, there is iconic memories and that strip was minted, the round neck with the yeah. gold trim. You're spot on, Phil. But I definitely think um, that Cal Mack takes his game to another level. The better he's coached, the better the belief in him. Mm. He's he's a good learner. He's someone who he's got that drive to want to be better. And I think that's I think that's what Roger looks for. In fact, he goes, "Do you want to be better? Do you want mm. to get better? See if you do. That's half the battle. Because I'm good at the rest. Do you know what I mean? But I need you to want it as much as like it's my role to to do it. You need to want it." I think that was, you know, not you could have done Scott Brown shows and stuff, but I think that was the question he's obviously asked him at that London dinner. Do you want to make a comeback? Do you want to fuck off eating mm -hmm. kebabs? 
you want to become these? Like, I actually do. Can you do that? Can you shift the mindset? And he's went, aye, I can. Whereas Cal McGregor probably wasn't having to shift it as much as Scott Brown. I think Scott Brown maybe lost his way a wee bit and for whatever reason. But I think he thought he was done, to be honest. I think Cal McGregor was on an upward trajectory, but it was steady. Mm-hmm. Whereas Brendan Rogers, his upward trajectory just went very steep, very quickly, and it was just that was a right match. And I think deep down, I think Cal Mack will be the one, and it's brilliant because he's now captain. He'll be the one who goes, "I know what he can do, like first hand. What he can do if I look at me, I wouldn't be Celtic captain if it wasn't for this guy." And if he's having that word in the ear of the players as well, mm-hmm. very exciting. And imagine the example you can give is. Me, imagine that being like I am the yeah. I am the the actual embodiment of what this guy can do in terms of improving someone's career and taking them to a level they didn't know they were capable of. And Cal McGregor, the one thing you love about him is he's got the ear of every single player. When he speaks, they listen. Yeah. So I, when he's given that example, I think that's a very very good thing. Ronnie Pickering, do the ear of the the ear of the Vichy pata with Otto Newman with his Adam's apple. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's enough for that. Oh, but Steve, with regards to like you know the technique of Cal Mack and how it came on leaps and bounds, so a few of the goals that I just rattled off there. Like obviously, we know that Cal McGregor's a left-footed player, right? He always has been. But the the goal in the cup final against Motherwell, it was a right foot goal. The one in the semi final, the four 0 against Rangers, it was right foot. And the one against Rangers at Celtic Park, it was right foot. I think again, that's something that Brendan sort of. Brendan and the coaching team have brought out him to try and use his weaker foot a bit more because he has got quite a good track record of scoring goals with his, what would be deemed his weaker foot, even though he's a predominantly left foot player. It's a bit unusual because you find that a lot of right-footed players can handle it on the left-hand side, but left-footed players are basically the left foot or nothing. So, yeah. But he has got quite a few moments and uh, goals using his right foot. He does. Uh, he's not afraid to use it when he needs to. But I think maybe, you know, again, it all comes down to development of players and confidence and things like that. You know, it could, it could just be like a, a sleeper, two-footed player. You know, because you've never really seen, you know, everybody's got a, a sort of preference. I said I'm left footer myself and, you know, if I'm playing football, I, I can put the ball about my right foot. But you, you've got, you know, you've got a favourite foot for a reason. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe just as he's developed as a player and as he's come into a, a lot more confidence and sort of grew in his role, you just... It maybe goes unnoticed, do you know what I mean? Like, particularly when you're scoring goals, I think when you look at what foot the players hit with and stuff like that, you tend to base that round more on goals than anything because that's you know, that's essentially their, their, their weapon at the end of the day. So, uh, I he's probably he's but I think he's probably been a, a sleeper player that's been very much two footed, you've just never really actually noticed that. Um, and to say, but a lot of that will come with confidence as you as you move on and you see your game coming on. You'll try new things and you'll you'll be a bit more sort of you know you'll just try as I say you'll try new things and that'll be you know adapting to both sides of the park and both feet and stuff like that. But you know in Togsy's development, I'm quite interested to see what he'll become this season and moving forward mm-hmm. because yeah. there's nothing really to prove if that makes sense. Yep and. There's no, I, I know everybody can get better and find new levels, but I don't think there's any great additional level of improvement in him. I think mm-hmm. he's probably all the player that he's going to be. Yep. Um, and it would be interesting to see if he becomes more of the sort of sitting back and assessing and bringing on other players type of guy. Do you know what I mean? He'll still do what he needs to do. He'll still mm-hmm. lead to the front. But while his role and the way he applies himself, will it change a wee bit? That's what I'm most interested to see uh, with new mm. players coming in. And Aye. as we say, there's guys there that are, there's potential for them to grow and, and develop under Rodgers. And that's going to be a joint up sort of working mm. between Cal McGregor, as we say, has been the sort of example to say, here's, you know, look at me, here's what we can do. Yeah. So I think he'll be, he'll, he'll be, very much installing on the park whatever's going down mm-hmm. and training with Brendan Rodgers and try to feed that through. So I, I just want to see how he fits into a team. Not, not that he's going to change, but what his role beyond you know doing the meeting to a veg is going to be in the team. Because you notice that way, Scott Brown, his role did change. He was an ever present, but it just felt different. So mm-hmm. I'm expecting will we see something similar with. with um, Cal McGregor. So I, I don't 
perhaps we will. Maybe, maybe a bit, I, I say a bit more freedom. I just think his role will change. I don't think he necessarily needs to be this massive figurehead yeah. that you completely depend on. Mm-hmm. You know, I think when we go through a, a stage of transition under Postacoglu, he would have been somebody that we've looked at and it's been a transition mm-hmm. and it's bringing guys up. But now we're at that stage where aye, there's been some changes, but we're very much established. So as yeah. we've established and he's helped bed those players in, does his role change? So, you know, that'll be interesting mm-hmm. Ah, it's all um, you know, to come this season, but we find another level for Callum Greg. As you see, I, I agree. I think he has probably reached this. This is the zenith of Callum Greg, and obviously, he's fantastic. But you know, if, if, if Brendan Rodgers can find just something else, a wee bit more, then by all means, it'd be even better for us, more beneficial for us. So, uh, we'll need and, to you know, see it that also goes. comes down to some of the, the, the obviously it's speculation now, but we know there's going to be new players coming in. And let's mm-hmm. just say, for example, if it was that boy reader. It's like completely different, you know what I mean? He's going to be playing alongside somebody like Cal McGregor, so that instantly shifts his role. Cal yeah. McGregor's pushing us up the park a lot. Is that going to change? So, yeah, we might see something completely different from him. Nah, we might do, we might do with that one. Um, but no, he's just turned 30 years old. I think this yep. is the thing as well. I think Brown had just turned 31 when Rogers took over, and mm-hmm. as you say, took on a new lease of life. It was a different identity. I think Steve was right in that. I think he was a different sort of formation of himself. I don't know what Cal Mac. I just think right now, I look at the, the generation of, of of when sort of centre midfielders of the last sort of five, six years, if you actually look at the age they're now, the, the top players at the top clubs are now, we are not an elite club, but in our comparison sort of level, it's nothing to stop Callum McGregor having another maybe two different adaptions to his game and mm-hmm. maintaining his place in the team. And that wouldn't be out of sentiment. I don't think Callum McGregor would play out of sentiment. Do you know what I mean? I think he's someone that very much will be in the team on merit. And mm-hmm. I do think that might involve over the next four or five years a couple of variations of the, the, the profile Callum McGregor has. But the one thing I do definitely think that's very important to Brendan is he likes to have his ear on the pitch. He yeah. wants someone to go, you're my version of me on the park. Yep. Alex Ferguson did it with Roy Keane, right, for 10 years. They might hate each other now, but it's all bullshit, right? There is 100% the, the reason Roy Keane was so effective was because he passed on exactly the message that Ferguson was wanting to translate to the players, but that was his on-park, if you like, version of him. And mm-hmm. I think Rodgers is very much wanting someone who he's eleven to be that guy who is like, we know the score here. Me and you are on the same page. Cal mm-hmm. McGregor will fill that role. And I think that also plays a massive importance on how a team functions um, when it's getting led by someone who's almost playing the role of the manager, if you like, or passing yeah. on the manager's sort of message in real time on the park. Do you know what I mean? I think that becomes that takes a hell of a lot of uh, years to build. Luckily for us, Rogers isn't new to Celtic. Yeah. He got those years in the tank. This mm-hmm. will not be difficult to implement. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I think, maybe when you look at the Angira, um, as much as I think Cal McGregor found his, his, his approach refreshing, I think Cal McGregor found winning refreshing again after yeah. the dreadful year before. And I think oh, yeah. no matter who came in, if there's something that goes back to winning, their message was going to be refreshing. I think Callum McGregor and Rogers have a far, far stronger bond than mm-hmm. what McGregor and Ange Postacoglu ever would have. I think so as well. It's very well known that McGregor began to find the level that he is now under Brendan. So, um, yeah, there's definitely a, a good working relationship with the two of them. And, yeah, they'll be delighted to be working again uh, together this season uh, going forward. But in the the season that followed the 2018 one, things were all changed because Brendan didn't stick around, obviously, for the full season, as we know, as we've discussed many, many times. February of 2019 rolled around and Carl McGregor uh, found that the manager had left. Brendan Rodgers, obviously, up sticks and off he went. And Neil Lennon came in to uh, steady the ship and get us over the line. But that season, um, is, again, his number of games went up again from 55 games the season before to playing 59 games this time, so it's edging up every single time we had a return of six goals and this one I found quite astounding as well, in the season that followed that was obviously the one that got cut short because of COVID, 
Right, so you're talking what the was it March the twentieth or something like the season got basically ended. Cal McGregor played fifty two games that season, and we only played up to March. <laughs> that's what? actually mental. That's nuts. That's like every cup game he must have played, every league game up to that point, and every European game he's got to have played in every one of them to that point. By fifty two games he played, and he scored uh, thirteen goals. In that time as well, in the 2019-20 season, which ended in March of 2020. Who do I hear that, though? Who do I hear that? <laughs> the, the, the new Lennon got a tune out of Callum McGregor. Yeah. Oh, impossible. Uh-huh. He, wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to relate to the way Lennon's uh, old methods are. I think Callum McGregor's and Kieran Tierney's of the world were giddy that Neil Lennon was joining. I think, see, when he yeah. took over for the last eight games, see if you remember at Hearts, I know it was Tierney, not McGregor necessarily, but it's mm. like them two in like, the headlock at Tincastle, remember? I think like Tierney's like, no danger. Like, <laughs> you know, do you know Tierney's favourite player of all time is Bobo Baldi? That oh, was yeah. his hero growing up. <laughs> That's it. He was, that was me. He goes, I don't know why. He goes, I just, Bobo was my favourite eh, when I was a kid. But that tells you that's the era of Neil Lennon. So this guy is like a Scottish player coming through. When he's a different, like a different version of the Lenny, I think the some of the other ones who might be a bit baffled by his antics are. Mm. Um, and I wonder if like, I don't think Kyle Mack would look as despairingly at uh, Neil Wenning as maybe some of our fans do. I think Carl McGregor probably was gutted that it didn't work out in the, the 10 in a row season for Lennon because you look at that year before, as you say, he played me 52 times. I got 13 goals in that time. I was playing some pretty good stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like I was, he was. I was pretty important there and he definitely knew how to get a tune out of me. He understood my role. He knew how mm-hmm. to get the best out of me. He knew how to utilise me. And like, you know, it's an interesting take that when I. Right. Yeah, I well, that's the thing. We it, talked about when we were on the show last week with the city group when we got to Olivia and Cham. We talked about the curious case of him. And there was a point where Lennon, where after the, the cup final, the infamous cup final that we scraped by Rangers and then they beat us in the league game a couple of weeks later. And everyone thought, oh, that's it. The tide's turned. You know, Rangers will go on and win the league that season. And because they've got Celtic's number now. And then we came back for the Dubai break, infamously Dubai again. Eh? Oh, uh, but we came oh. back and everything seemed to turn in our favour. And it's because Neil Lennon went on like a mad like 13 game unbeaten run or something like that, like 1 12 drew one. And uh, a couple of the change moves, obviously, 3 5 2 formation. Uh, and McGregor was right in the heart of that in the middle of the park. And Cham got a lot of game time because he looked like he was actually motivated again. Um, and yeah, the two up front, you know, say change it to 3 5 2, and all these things all seem to click. Because I think I mentioned it last week. There's one game in particular I can remember. We beat Murrowell at Fur Park 4 0, and it was just this brilliant team goal that I believe Callum McGregor scores like this half volley from the edge of the area. It just like bounces up to him on the edge of the area, and he just volleys it right in the top corner. And we were just playing some scintillating football at that point in time. And yeah, McGregor was very much in the engine room part of that there. But um, yeah, and to see when you go into the that season, 52 games, the, the season ended in March, so he was just like, he, he must have played in every single match we must have played at oh, that point. Yeah, it was kind of numbers. And then you think mm-hmm. how many that be if that was a full season? Aye. I know, because he was well on course to do about pff, 70, probably about 70 games he would have got that season, the way things were going. Just, um... Then, thank you. Well, do you technically, no, nah, you don't. I was going to say to pick up the additional appearance after they come back but no you probably uh, don't no. but before we go it's into wild the... though it is wild yeah. how 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 conditioned Callum McGregor is to just be like I play every single game for Celtic the League Cup games I tend to be the one who's the first team regular who plays yeah. internationals yep I'm the one that he lets play all the call say it's a three game break he's mm-hmm. the one who plays the 90 minutes and all so you never see him subbed off all the rest of them seem to get this rotation, right? <laughs> Callum McGregor, I'm the guy who plays the 90 minute. He just doesn't, you know, he never stops, mate. Sure. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like, he definitely has a, a, an engine. And, and he's one of these guys that most most players you would fear would be burning out by this point. But ironically, mm-hmm. because his Celtic career started there, I don't mean late, but relatively late. By the time mm-hmm. he was 22, he was a first-team regular, which when you... You compare in contrast with a Rooney or an Owen at their clubs, yep. these guys did burn out playing the games they did. There's actually quite a lot to be said for Cal Max starting at the time he did because yeah. he was fully, maybe not quite fully, but his body's developed enough 
So mm-hmm. when he started playing that amount of games, he's not still growing as much. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe mm-hmm. tiny, tiny margins, and maybe his physique's changing a wee bit. But when you when you're 17, 18 doing that, your body's going through cycles that are mm-hmm. also as as um overwhelming as the amount of games that you've been asked to play. And you you actually mm-hmm. combine the two, it then has lasting effects. And by the time you get to tell you're not the same player. The best example of that is Kieran Tierney. You know, we enjoy Kieran Tierney coming through, but for a, large, for a large period of Kieran Tierney being at Celtic, I, I personally, and I still stand by it, I think Celtic ruined him physically for large periods by overplaying him. When he was but there was a dependency back. on him. You know, I know. That, this, that, thing, that, this is not that, alien to Celtic, that, mate, because you know, when Liverpool are de- demanding or depending on a Michael Owen who's 17 in the EPL, you'd think, surely you yep. could rotate him with the quality of... We were the same. Surely you could win the SP the SPL title with the quality you've got. Mm. I don't think Steve will be had a choice, but no. to play him that much, he's too good. He's too important. But you're right. The age combination it is. I get why Celtic have done it, but I think you're probably right. It has ended up burning him out. Yeah. See, I feel like I don't know. This feels to me like is this a real start? I feel like it was my mind playing tricks on me. But I'm sure at some point along the line, Callum McGregor was officially. Like played the most games of all senior players in European yeah, football no, for like a calendar year or something, wasn't it? That was a real thing. Exact number, but it was yeah. There was some stat that was going about, and it was uh, X amount of games, which I actually think I might be wrong on this, but I think one of the Rangers players was probably Tavernier Gold. So some one of them, I think, mm. went beyond that. Oh, boo! <laughs> um, oh uh, man. I'm pretty sure. I might be wrong, but I am pretty sure that one of them probably matched it. And I, I think it was. I think it was. Yeah. Fair I, see, I just remember at the time there was some sort of stat thing saying that Callum McGregor officially became like he played the most games in all of European football in um like a, a specific year. I was like, for yeah. sake, man, that's mental. And see, the guy just seemed to always be free of injury. You know, he doesn't seem to get... I mean, that one he got last year where he copped one against Red Bull Leipzig and was out for about 11 games or something. That's probably the longest term injury I think Callum McGregor's had so far at Celtic. I don't remember him missing like half a season or anything through injury. Um, but despite the amount of games he plays, because again, you just think the law of averages, his body's eventually going to tell him, enough is enough here. I can't handle this. But yeah, just, you know, he's... Every, every so far, every season I've went through, yeah, his number of games keeps really going up, injury. you know? He gets that. That's a really bad injury. Yeah. It, it, and it's a strange one as well, because he's just sort of running along. And then, you know, I, I was quite worried at that point. I thought that was going to completely mm-hmm. write off his entire season, to be honest with you. Aye. Especially because I don't know that used to seeing him breaking down with any injury. And then you see that, oh, no. Oh, I was... thought he lost his ACL or something like that at the time. Aye. That would be that would be oh, brutal, like that, very right. brutal. But speaking of brutal, we'll need to address this before we do because the sort of second part of the show will be more about current day McGregor and all the stuff he's done as captain the last couple of seasons and that. But before we get there, we need to briefly touch on what happened in the <clears throat> Terry Monroe season. Yes, that one that didn't quite go well. Do you guys remember the infamous post-match interview against Sparta Prague where Callum McGregor seemed to? Because normally he's very. He's very vanilla when it comes to a post-match interview. You know, he just comes out and he'll just be like, oh, yeah, you know, we've done really well today. It's very generic stuff. But then, totally out of character, but it gave you an insight as to how bad things were getting. Because it was around about November. We'd lost to Rangers in that game where we didn't get a shot on target. We had that draw with Aberdeen where we were, what, two goals ahead? Or was it 3-2 going into the last minute? And we gave away a penalty and disastrous times. But then we got gobbed by Sparta Prague. Absolutely horsed. 4-1 at home. And um, he looked he, he looked like a deer in the headlights or a rabbit in the headlights that you said earlier on, Russell, we were talking about your post on Facebook. Well, he's getting interviewed after the game. He looked totally shell-shocked. He's usually quite calm and composed. He's saying things like, you know, uh, we look so disjointed out there. It's unbelievable. Um, we've got to, obviously, well, everyone in the team looks like they're trying to score a goal. So that's probably a dig at Ryan Christie, I would imagine, who just shoots from distance constantly. <laughs> and he's saying, we're leaving two for two at the back and all that. And he was just, he was just coming out and saying that, Everything's a mess. The tactics, the whole team's a mess, essentially. It was like, this is not the usual cookie-cutter Callum McGregor interview that you get after the game. He was actually kind of pulling the pulling the curtain back a wee bit on how things were. And, of course, at that point in time, 
we were starting to get the impression that things weren't going too well at Celtic, but when he's kind of, kind of coming and saying it, Russell, you kind of know, yeah, if it, we're, we're heading down a bad road here. Yeah, but I also think when people like that speak in a in a manner that you're not accustomed to, you listen. You tend to listen mm-hmm. more because he's yeah. not a, a typical rocker of said boat. He's someone who mm-hmm. tends to, as you say, toe the party line. He's very mm-hmm. straight, you know, straight laced. And then when there is a wee bit of emotion involved and there is a wee bit of real criticism, realistic criticism, not criticism for criticism's sake or hysterical sort of noise to try mm-hmm. and sort of do the you know, the, the proverbial sort of uh, badge kissing and, and chest pumping stuff. He's actually saying it with, with a bit of backbone, a bit of purpose to it as yeah. well. And yeah, going probably against the grain of his character doing it, which again, I think then adds depth to what he's actually saying. It adds layers to it because you go, he wouldn't say that, would he? That's not really mm. like, if he's doing that, then maybe it should prick in, you know, prick your ears, you know, yeah. listen to interest, you know, listen with a wee bit more interest than normal because I, I think when he's going that far, there has to be a reason behind it that, well, obviously we might not know to, an ex, you know, to its full extent, but I definitely don't think we'd be done, as I say, for the sake of it. I think there's definitely a meaning yeah. behind it when, when Carl Mack talks like that. I mean, I think it's one of those, you know, you take it both ways. I think I think he says it because he cares. He says it because mm. he's frustrated. But when you look at it in hindsight, it's actually detrimental in an already bad situation. Mm-hmm. Because My opposition idea. smell fear. And the one thing you never do is show weakness in an old marina. And mm. he does it. And he picks us apart. But as I say, it's just probably a reaction to a ship yeah. show behind the scenes and where we are at at that time. Mm. And it's maybe to show... Maybe in his subconscious, he's thinking to fans, I'll be honest, I'll show that I care. Mm-hmm. But the flip side of that is, you just pull back the curtain, you expose how much a shit show we are, and opposition like that, they smell fear. Mm-hmm. And you're, you know, the next game, the next game, you're behind the, you're behind the, the, the eight ball, do you know what I mean? So I, I think, think that it's one of the ones that it's, if I, I dare say if you asked them, they'd probably mm-hmm. regret doing it. I, I, mean, I think that's fair, but I think sometimes with the guys like that, like it becomes something you cannot help. And yeah, I think no, that's why I can't get to no, so go, that's someone who's doing it from a position of yeah. care. Yeah. That's yeah. someone doing it from a position of care. And you're right, probably by hindsight, you'd go, mm, not the best move. But that would be him then resorting back to type, where he would say, not the best move. I think when folk have moments like that, you go, no, no, I'm talking to that because it's, it's like Chris Commons going mental. Yeah, well, remember that. Yeah, what did he say? Aye, then? Aye, he said, aye, aye. Did you say what did Colin say to them? He no, said something like, he's, he was, he's pointing to the fans, going, Listen to them because they were all listen doing them, all that. That was it. You know what? At the time I went, He's fucking right. Yeah. I what took Colin's side the time. I know. But again, I don't know if that was out of character now that I know who Chris Commons is in the media. I go, maybe he's yeah. a bit of a prick. <laughs> some player, but some player. Oh, he, he did. I uh, definitely put in some amazing numbers for us. But yeah, that that moment. But I uh, goes over the bench and he's like, you know, listen to them. Actually, we're just they were just booing like the fans were had enough at that point. But um, yeah, McGregor doing that. And uh, I watched the interview earlier on and sort of prep for this and. Uh, later on in the interview, he says, you know, he's just he's just used words like it's embarrassing. And then the last he was interviewing him asks, like, where does it rank in terms of like the worst performances you've been involved in? And he was just like, it's just it's just one of the worst I've ever been. But it was it was a terrible performance that night, and that was about November 2020 when you know we talk about Shark Gate, we lost, lost to Ross County a couple of weeks before. So it was around about that time where things were starting to fall apart and you could see it. But when he did that, obviously. It gave you a sort of insight that oh god, the, the dressing room is kind of falling apart. But then, of course, it was all change. It was all change, and uh, obviously going into the the next season because yep, obviously the ten in a row didn't happen as we planned. It did, and uh, yeah, we uh, found ourselves with Neil Lennon. He ended off into the sunset essentially. He was Ofsky. John Kennedy, he took over, and uh, it didn't quite work out for John either, but he still stuck around. But yeah, we need a new manager. Apparently, Eddie Howe's going to be the saviour. No, he's not, because at the 11th hour, Eddie Howe is going to decide 
nah, I don't really fancy that. He obviously wanted to bring in his band of merry men, his absolute army of merry men by the sounds of it. There's those stories you hear. He wanted 10 people, 15 people, 20 people, whatever. But for some reason, Celtic and Eddie Howe couldn't come to an agreement. The 11th hour was changed to an Ange Postacoglu became the favourite, and uh, he obviously came in and became manager, and with Scott Brown obviously leaving as well, um, he headed off to Aberdeen, the club was in need of a new captain. So, uh, Steve, to you first, who in your mind at that point in time did you think would get the captaincy? Did you think it would be Callum McGregor, or was there anybody else in the team that you were like, I think it'll be him? I mean, you know, the safe money was always on Cal McGregor simply because of the sort of like, almost vice captain type role and you know the midfield mm. thing. I think at the time I didn't really have any great preference. I think there's this mm. he's not he's not captain material. It's hard to tell. It's maybe just because he's such a quiet guy. Mm. I think he just revert to type and you know would have I had necessarily said this who I wanted. No, but I, I probably would have imagined somebody maybe like a a Chris Ayer would have been brought in. As a sort mm-hmm. of big defender at the back, and also probably somebody that they wanted to keep hold of, and that's the kind of thing that keeps folk at clubs. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I, I probably would have thought it would have been, yeah, I'd something. Have cried like if it had been, a, I'd have cried if it had been. I thought he was a virtue signalling load yeah. of pesh. He tackled with the wrong foot all the time. Side tackle, side tackles the wrong foot. Watch how he does it. Mm. It's so uncoordinated. It's unreal. Heather in a football. Oh, fucking hell, no what the KT's laddies won't be you won't be his their favourite player anyway. There, like there was a goal was, we lost in the he, he ducks. He fucking under ducks. Under the Morelos one, the Morelos one at Ibrox, he ducks under it. What are you yeah. ducking there? Like it's not gonna hurt Christopher. Um, yeah, six, but yeah, six, five he was, or something like that. He he was the, if he'd been became a captain, I think we would have been in real big trouble. Do real you know big is, trouble. Steve O. I'm, ex- I'm the same as Steve. Yeah. I at that time thought that was going to happen because, and again, no. you're talking about virtual signaling. I was relaying back to an incident no. like how he used to wind them up and get under their skin. And I was like, hey, he gets it. I know you love that expression, Steve. He gets it. Uh, I'm thinking <laughs> of the one when, uh, the one when Ryan Kent ah, um, punched me. Even time, Andy <laughs> Halliday's having the meltdown. And it's I or Scott Bain and Scott Brown are all just laughing and Andy Halliday's face and just wind them up. And I'm like, he gets it, Chris Ayer gets it, and plus we we're trying to, are we going to keep Ayer, are we no? So I was like, oh, the captaincy would be like a thing that might keep him here, but no, nah, obviously it was definitely not the choice at all, he went off the pastures new, and it was Callum McGregor, but what yourself Russell, were you looking at that team and going Callum McGregor's outstanding choice, or was there a left field one that you thought maybe it'll be him that'll be the club captaincy? Well, you know, I just wanted to see him play a couple of games you know? <laughs> Oh, man there, but there was one captain for me. <laughs> uh, no, I, I thought it would be. I thought it would be. I think I froze my way through that. I think that's the fucking internet even telling me to stop doing that. Do you know what I mean? But um, just, just thank you, broadband, for the wisdom. That's the universe speaking. <laughs> stop doing that stupid impression. Uh, but no, I definitely thought it would be Cal McGregor. I thought he was the heir to the throne. Mm-hmm. Um, it made sense. I think we spoke about it a lot in the, in the other fellow's pod. Do you know what I mean? I think we were pretty like it'll be Carl McGregor. I was actually worried though. I was like, I hope it doesn't get too big for him because yeah. he's coming in the back of, I think it made, mo- I'm sure what I was saying at the time was that would have made loads of sense on the back of the 10. Brown fucks off into the sunset. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like captain leader legend. And then it's all, everyone's just on such a buzz. It couldn't be better for Quiet or state, stated sort of person that, that like uh, an understated sort of person like Callum McGregor to become the captain, we see a different form of captaincy because he is not the same. I think he's learned a lot for Scott Brown, but they are, hmm. yeah. Maybe we thought, I think less chalk and cheese than we maybe thought at the time, by the way, as well. You know, since so hmm. seen Shite Bag Gate and that, we now kind of go, actually, he's got a wee bit of chops about him for, for a captaincy role. Um, but I definitely think. It, I worried that that might drown him now a wee bit because he's coming in in such a choppy waters, if you like. It was just not yeah. a nice situation to come in. And I went, Cal Max kind of a nice guy. Do we need a nice guy? Are we needing mm-hmm. someone? But actually, it turns out he was absolutely perfect. He brought a balancing act. He brought a, mm-hmm. a measured approach. 
And as I say, there was moments throughout that season you went, actually, it's a bit of feistiness to that character anyway, that he's been maybe maybe wanting to get out. Maybe yeah. it was a bit good cop, bad cop before in the centre midfield. And he's yeah. like, the bad cop's gone. There's a new sheriff in town. I think he has took on a different streak to him. And I think you've seen that at times, a wee spikiness, a bit of spunk in his character. Can we like to say that? <laughs> I think we definitely yeah. have. <laughs> and I've got, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, man. And uh, I... He's definitely, it was proven to be the, the absolute right choice. I, I, And again, by the way, not saying Andrew's a yes man, but I don't think Andrew got a choice in who his captain was. I think Celtic told him who the, the captain was. The same way they told him who your yeah. assistant manager will be. You know, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah bitch. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, as the story goes, according to Andrew, and you can believe it if you want, then again, our current manager as well is prone to a wee uh, pokey pie here and there. He said that uh, he attended the Scotland-England game at Euro 2021, the, the game that we won 0-0. Remember, Scotland were amazing in that game, the 0-0. Um, but yeah, that was a game that he said he attended it with uh, Dominic Mackay, wasn't it? Dominic Mackay was alongside him at that one, the fever dream. Dominic Mackay, yes, he did actually happen, folks. He wasn't just, we didn't just imagine him, he was here for eight, eight nine weeks or something but yeah it did actually happen <laughs> and apparently he did meet with Carl McGregor after that game and get a rundown of the team and that and I think that was well according to Ange that was when it was so you're going to be the captain and stuff like that and he was very impressed with Carl McGregor's performance that night because yeah he was he was very very good as well, most of the Scotland team that night they played well but yeah that's the story of according to Ange when he first sort of got a chance to meet with McGregor because obviously Ange is coming in at a time when there was still a lot of COVID restrictions going on as well having isolating hotel rooms. It just so happened he was isolating down in London and happened to be a football tournament going on. There was a, a big game at Wembley Stadium, so that worked out pretty well for him. They could go to that and uh, meet with Callum McGregor. But yeah, he comes in. I, I know what you guys are saying. Like, I think a lot of people were just so conditioned. And again, you look at the younger generation fans, all they really knew was Scott Brown as captain. That was what we were used to. We were um, just that, that style. So even me, I got caught up in, I mean, I've been watching Celtic since the mid-90s, but I was that used to Scott Brown. Yeah. The entire time I'd been a season ticket holder, Scott Brown had been a Celtic player yeah. from 2007. So it was like my entire time of going, Scott Brown was always part of the team, but now he was gone, obviously being the captain. We were very used to the way he did it. So people were kind of thinking, are we just going to get that? How can, how can Callum McGregor possibly do the captain's role? Because that's a captain. So there's different ways to do it. Many ways to skin a cat, as Boise normally says. Many, many ways to do it. And yes, he it's, certainly it's, did. It's, you don't get... It's maybe if you look even beyond the Scott Brown thing, you look a wee bit behind that. Like, mm. most captains, obviously, if you trace it back, you've maybe got... Like a Paul Lambert, last when he sort of deputised, and maybe like a McNamara. But anything after that for long periods, it was all something that was kind of rough and ready. Do you mm. know what I mean? I think also though Scott Brown got the camp saying it saved okay. his football career. I think it saved his, his Celtic career. But given the extra responsibility, I think mm -hmm. he was close to being offloaded. At that point, I'm yeah. I'm quite convinced Aye. of that. I am quite convinced. Yep. I think the captain say elevated him to somewhere. Mm -hmm. So he he took it from a different space. And I think he realized I need to do the the you know the sort of stereotypical mm -hmm. old school captain yep. role. And that was a big part of why I'm in the team because my form isn't maybe the best right now. Callum McGregor got the camps he based on. I think what Steve was talking about there, a Henrik or a Jackie, pure form, plays every week for a reason because they're that good. It's a natural fit to then stick the armband on them. That makes sense to me. I also contrast it a bit, whilst the debate is always very lively about has Callum McGregor overtaken Paul McStay in the land of Celtic greats? I also look at it and go, are they two people you could also compare and contrast as, would you naturally see them as captains, either of them? Maybe not. Maybe not. But, they, but do you know what I mean? They are definitely meant to be Celtic captains. You just might not be able to see it in plain sight the same way. I think Lenny looked at Scott Brown and went, what's missing for him? Because how good a footballer is this guy? This guy's the record transfer between Scottish clubs. He, I know how good he was. I played against him when he was at Hibs. He was a cheeky wee shy. He was loud then. <laughs> he was someone who dominated that Hibs team pers as personality-wise, which, Aye. as you said, was full of larger-than-life characters. Scott Brown was the largest by a country. Man. He's like, nah, there's something missing for him. Maybe the extra responsi responsibility will take not just his game to another level, but actually bring out, bring out the best around him. Whereas yeah. I think Cal Mack went back to... Maybe how McStay got it, you know, default, just too good. Plays every week. That's why he gets the captain's armband. 
Aye, uh, certainly does play every week, sixty games a year or something. He's up to at this point in time. Um, but Steve, obviously, you've mentioned many times on uh, on the Boise Bus Group chat, you have a a file on your computer called "Saved for Future Embarrassment," and it's usually screen grabs and yes. whatnot of tweets and <laughs> <laughs> other messages of the that lot have been saying across the city. And have you noticed in social media since Callum McGregor became the captain how much they really hate Callum McGregor, which really took me by surprise because again I was like, he seems like such a sort of unassuming character, but they they put him on a level I think with Scott Brown and the hatred they've got towards him. They proper because the amount of times I read screen grabs of like follow follow or tweets yeah. that they put out, and they've always got the same rhetoric of oh he's not as good as you know he's made out to be or. You know, they come and it's like they've always got this idea. And it's like, well, if our team isn't as good as what you think, how come we keep on beating you to all these yeah. trophies? As well, does that make use? But have you noticed that it's sort of like, I, I don't know if it's the sledging that he does on park, like, you know, Colin Barr is such a shite bag or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the, the amount of vitriol that I'll read on their forums and tweets aimed at Callum McGregor, and I'm like, yeah, I, I'm I, shocked. I think, <laughs> it, you know, listen, they hate anybody. Mm. That's successful. Let's be honest. To hate anybody that's that's in, in you know, position at Celtic, any captain, um, and I think for me it is kind of surprising because it, it was such a steady sort of, you know, it just sort of ramped up, and it was it was after the it was mainly after the mask game, whereas mm. they like to use the term because that's the way the things are over there when he was dubbed the Fenian of the Opera because <laughs> yes. That's right. That's what they were all calling him after Aye. that game because they were raging after mm-hmm. that. And it was really kind of after that game that it all started to ramp up, was it not? Because do you not remember mm-hmm. there was the whole, I can't believe nobody gave the mask a dunt to test Chris out. Boyd, that. that was Chris Boyd that said that. Aye. Aye. You know, it was it was mental. Mm-hmm. And as you say, it's, it's always trying to sort of like minimise the achievements of somebody like like uh, Cal McGregor. You know, he plays for his country and he's bedded in and he's a vital part of that for a reason. There's a reason that he's driving force at Celtic. There's a reason he wins so much stuff. But then it's always contrast and compare. We've got a captain that does all this. He does all the performance. He scores goals and he wins trophies. But they've got their captain who they try to somehow compare. Two things are not the same, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. But I, I don't understand because I think that, as we say, Cal McGregor, he has got a wee bit of needleism. He has got that wee bit of sort of, mm. you know, nip around him and it's sort of come out more. And you've noticed it in quite a lot of games. But I think it's quite simply that it's come out maybe a wee bit more against them mm-hmm. in games. And that's really got under their skin. Um you know, I, like the likes of the chasing down Barisic and shouting at him stuff, and <laughs> so it can be something as simple as how he how he celebrates when we score a goal against them and stuff like that. You know, it, they just yeah. let's face it, they just hate success, don't they? They do. They hate say anything in the. They hate the runs away. Goes, Come on! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Pat O's saying this, and he can write. It's if Cody and C Brown and Callum as being tongue calls because there was that urban legend that Brown had a Rangers tattoo on his leg, and apparently Callum McGregor was born and raised a Rangers fan. But hey, mm-hmm. so was Kenny Dalglish, and so was Danny McGrain. It happens to footballers at the end of the day, and if they get the money and they get the opportunity. Doesn't really matter. So yeah, that whole idea that they're just raging because he's a tongue coat. It's like, come on, man. It's like, it's exactly. it happens. It's happened. It's, time. it's not anything. To, you know. But, but Phil, I'm not. I am not Callum McGregor, right? And I can't do like fucking, yeah. you know, eighty minutes without a fucking piss, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like, are we having right. a break tonight? Are we? Are we not? Oh yeah, we kind of just it's because of the musical thing. Yeah, I'm a, still a, have the whoa, musical whoa, break. Whoa, whoa, like, I'm not Calamac, like, I, like, I can't go this slow, <laughs> well, mate. Well, you, I love you his go. consistency. Well, I go. You go just now, and I'll, right? talk, I'll keep talking to Steve, oh, aye, that's absolutely fine. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, lads. I was like, I'm at, I'm at 18 minutes, I didn't want to be rude, but I'm at 18 minutes is a fair amount of time to right. go. It's because we still don't have the musical thing sorted out. We need a musical interlude back. That's what we need. So. For fuck's sake. <laughs> right, Boys, you musician. Are you a musician? Do you want to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you on you go. On you go. <laughs> yes, yeah, so as he disappears for a couple of minutes, he will we'll just have uh, just 
guy on the the chat for the time being. But yeah, just again, just thinking of some of the slides and stuff. And in fact, you saw it recently in Scotland. Did you know the infamous Scotland game for a few weeks ago against Georgia, the washout when yeah. it was back and forth? Is the game going to get started or not? There was a moment where he went over to like the Georgia captain or something was the, talking with the referee, and he said something like, "We'll just fly over to fucking Georgia and play this." Because uh, he just, he's, he's just <laughs> it. I know he just he's he's and that side coming out of him. I guess it's probably things that he's probably taken from Scott Brown to a degree, or maybe again it's always been part of him. We just haven't had a chance to see it. But yeah, I think the sledging part does get under the does get under the skin quite a bit. And yeah, the baddest such moment is is a uh, legendary. It became an instant meme, didn't it? It's shite back. Well, if you think about it, see during the sort of. Um, we were talking earlier on about the Brendan Rodgers sort of era at first, the first mm-hmm. time round. He was doing a lot of damage against them and he was just another player in the park. That's right, he was. It didn't right. really make any difference. He was scoring a lot of goals and he was, he was you know, orchestrating a lot of key performances against them and it didn't really matter. But I mm-hmm. think that is just because, let's be honest, it's easy. Your captain's the easiest one to gravitate towards disliking, isn't it? Because they literally oh, have their head. And yep. I think the combination of that and says in a wee bit it'll be, you know, jealousy. I say I would say the green eyed monster, but that's obviously mm. not blue. But you know what I mean? No. That idea that you've got something across the city that's far more successful, far more accomplished, far better footballer and whole package that it's easy to have just a, a deep set desire that want to diminish that. And I think that's Aye. pretty much what it is, because neither or not. He's not a dislikable guy. Aye, totally constant professional. Right? I know a lot of folk are not, he's, you know, he's, he's turned into gravy guzzler and all that now, do you know what I mean? But um, he's a kind of non-offensive guy. Mm-hmm. And they really wanted to hate him. They did, do you know what I mean? Yeah. They really wanted to hate him. And it was just something as simple as fat bastard, just because he's successful. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it is. Aye. And we'll get something, there'll be something for Brendan Rodgers, won't there? It'll be, oh, they'll come out with something. And they always and, do. And, and prick your son. Do you know what I mean? It'll be something. Because <laughs> that's just that's, what it is. That's, that's just the way things go. Oh, so, the, the, I just, yeah, just some of the part they come out with is just absolutely embarrassing. So, I think when Brendan was here the first time around, they came calling him Brenda. And then, first yeah. thing it seems already. Aye, so we'll, we'll see what we'll see what they come up with there. But, but yeah, in terms of like, um, you know, just like inspiring moments and stuff like that, and I'd becoming captain, I think the one that, well, the first, one of the first ones that comes to my mind is getting that first trophy and how important it was to him. Uh, and obviously we played Hibs in that cup final, um, where the the League Cup one just before the another mini COVID shutdown. You know they gave his football back and then they took it away briefly, but it was right before that. But obviously Celtic going through a pretty dismal year to say the least of a uh, winning absolute hee haw. The importance of winning, you know, the first trophy of the season, Cal McGregor's first as captain. And again, if you see the footage at full time and just how much it meant to him during the celebrations, during the lap of honour, and that, you know, what a, what a relief it was for him. Because, yeah, that game, that was the, the walking wounded game. We were going into that one with a lot of injury problems. Mikey Johnston started that game. Owen Moffat came off the bench. Kyogo oh, had been rushed wow. back from a hamstring injury. Scored two goals, two magnificent goals in the stuff. final. But obviously he's then injured against the next game we played against St. Johnston, I think it was. Yep. Or nice. a couple of games later, he went up the hamstring he's just back. went on yeah. him. Aye. So yeah. we were we were just it was hamstring gate going on at that point in time, but it was just such a important yeah, game for them to get over the line, wasn't it? You back for the potty, baby. He is. <laughs> baby. What a baby. Big baby. Baby. <laughs> baby. Just just sometimes like when I drink like cans of still and that like I just need to go for a big fucking piss, you know what I mean? Like you just gotta do it, mate. Do you know what I mean? You gotta go, you gotta go. It's that <laughs> simple. I've washed my hands, I'm ready to rock now, man. Good stuff, mate. Now we'll just talk about like obviously big moments for uh Cal Mack. I'm saying the first trophy naturally as captain was huge, and that was that Hibs game. I was just saying to Steve over there how we were the walking wounded as well, going into it with some of the injury problems we had and if you remember how that game played out as well, Steve, uh, that was one of those games where Carl Starfelt was having an absolute nightmare against oh. Kevin Nisbet. He was getting haunted. We went a goal down, obviously, Paul Hanlon, where Joe Hart, which is something that, you know, we talk about Joe Hart and, you know, I, I still think he is obviously a, a good keeper, but he has got some some problems in this game. And one of things come for crosses in that corner. He just watches it the entire time, just watches it come in. And Paul Hanlon gets the run on the defender and scores. But I say we, we rallied, we got it. But yeah, if you look at the celebration, Steve, when you see how much that meant to Callum, 
huge, huge moment. Yeah, I think it's, you know, obviously we've spoken of these, you know, the terms coming of age moments and stuff with, with Cal McGregor. I think, you know, the, the importance of taking up the mantle and mm. it's just it's, it, it's important for him as it is for Ange Postecoglou and that team at that time to get that first sort of notch on their belt, do you know what I mean? Mm. To, to show a, a, a sort of, you know, a, a, a swing to the tide, you know, the tide's yeah. turning. He, Celtic are actually back in, in some mm. sort of form that you knew them. But also yeah. for him, it probably instilled a lot of confidence into him moving forward. Because as we say, we went for an absolute rat shit season with massive disappointment. Yeah. Big personalities moving on to a complete rebuild that mm. he's suddenly been thrust into a position that, as we've been discussing, yeah. not a lot of folk maybe thought that he had the minerals to adapt and do. So there probably as much as there's emotion and joy in his face. There's probably a big sigh of relief underneath it all. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, He's I probably think. saying, fucking yes, man. Thank yeah. fuck. Here we go. I'm mm-hmm. I'm on I'm on the ladder as a Celtic captain. Well trophy to my name. Yep. Indeed. Well, aye, that, that, that was step one. Aye. But Russell, I'm going to throw one at you. This is one of your favourite moments, I know, from doing this show with you. I know this is one that comes up a lot for you. You like to use it as McGregor's a, a perfect moment. example. Oh, McGregor, yes. We're talking about, again, those McGregor's moments, moment. defining like moments as a Sophie's captain. Sophie's choice. Yes. <laughs> we're, uh, we're at Ibrox. We've had an absolute stinker of a start. Aaron Ramsey's putting the goal up. And we're all over the place. I mean, Juranovic was having a mad game as well in that first five or six minutes. And then the captain decides, no, nah, fuck that for a laugh, gets on the ball, and he takes control of the game. He just goes on a run right through their defence, which they just can't seem to defend, and it results in us getting the equaliser, and then the tide starts to turn in that game. But again, yes. that is the big moments that you're you looking for from the captain. Deck it when he runs through as well. Like, he kinda gets I think through. he slides as he passes it across. I think he does. Really aye. It's almost a tackle pass. What's aye. happened though is, what's happened is, We've had eight or nine minutes where we were unrecognisable mm-hmm. for the team we've beaten, right? That's, you know, for the, yeah. for the for the very, very sketchy opening seven games, you know, to, to then the period in between where we'd won every single match, it's suddenly at Ibrox, we did look like we were folding, like, you know, the Dave King deck of cards thing, you know what I mean? But we <laughs> did look, Juranovic, I know it's lucky he was a Croatian internationalist because... Fuck me! <laughs> I, I, like, he looked like he was playing in fucking sliders. You know what I mean? I mean two bob sliders. I've never seen anyone incapable of passing a ball like that. He was jelly mm-hmm. legs. He, he was. It was like me at the sevens after the first time I'd played in four years. <laughs> See the last twenty minutes, I was looking down at my feet, going, "I actually don't know what foot he damn." It was like quaver toes, curly toes. How's it nose? I didn't have a clue what was going on. And he was at that point, the Gengo Juranovic, but he was only one of many. We couldn't string two passes together. We'd already considered to go to the biggest fraud in Scottish football, do you know what I mean, since the last one they signed, Joey Barton, right? And <laughs> yep. and that was insult to injury. Carmack, for whatever reason, has McGregor's moment, as I called it. But when mm-hmm. he's decided, holy shit, it is on me. I'm the captain. Mm-hmm. It's my job to do this. He goes in that run, and I've said this before, it doesn't matter that we've scored at the end of it. He'd already single-handedly swung the momentum of a football match. Mm-hmm. Like, you've never... Like, I just thought that is incredible. The pressure we were under at that point, that we're under the cosh, we're a goal down, and we do look all at sea. Cal mm-hmm. McGregor's run means so much more than that. I think the goal out of it was, you know, very, very deserving because of the moment. Mm-hmm. I don't think that mattered. The goal's now coming. We've swung the momentum. The balance of the yep. game has changed. And it's because he has just went, fucking just remembered, I can play football. And so mm-hmm. can the rest of us. And it actually turns out we're better than the guys we're against. Watch this. Yeah. Just a wee dribble from mm-hmm. the ages. And then the determination to get that cut back is how it results in it looking like a, a sliding tackle almost yeah. short of pass. But that's just, a, that's just that absolute drive to make sure here's the last word on a, a move he's created completely single-handedly it's and his, that changed that game it's his for me it's his Scott Brown was the goalie day moment where mm-hmm. Celtic are under the cosh against yeah, yeah. the ascendancy Scott Brown does it for a long distance pass but he sees something and thinks watch us world class and world sets class. up his hands. Mm-hmm. he does essentially the same but in a slightly different context where he makes the run. Mm. 
but it's stay them up, seeing something, seeing an opportunity and mm. making a big chess move and a game under the cosh against the odds at Ibrox. So, you know, comparable in that respect. Do you know what's also awesome about it? This wasn't son, he let fester. This was only mm. nine minutes in the game. I... He has had, whoa, this ain't happening any longer. Someone has to grab this by the scruff. And he mm. literally did, but he does it in a footballing way that was really, yep. really clever. It's a brilliant dribble. It's a dribble yep. that, you know, Jota would be proud of, you know, R.I.P. But do you know what I mean? It was a it was a role. It was a sort of move that, you know, the really accustomed Cal McGregor way dribbles from the halfway. Even Tom Rogers is going, fuck, sake, I don't remember. Past, uh, I don't remember saying, past, I don't remember past, saying, hold, I don't remember saying, hold my beer, Callum, at any point. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Cal McGregor's like, no, I asked you to hold my fosters, you bastard. Watch. <laughs> this is what needs to be done. And, uh, mm. yeah, I think that moment is where he really did. He found these bollocks as a Celtic captain. Do you know what I mean? The yeah. penny dropped. But what I love about it is how early he recognised it. This isn't a game he's mm. like, get to half time and go, oh, I need a manager to guide me and go, <laughs> come on, Callum, lead by yeah. example. Nah, he recognised in under 10 minutes how mm. far away from it we were. And how to get us back in, he did it himself. And by the way, as I, I keep going back to, yes, we got a goal out of it. That is what was deserving of the moment, but mm -hmm. it wasn't actually definitive. The moment that was definitive was how That's we led one. up to that. Because yep. the goal then would have came at some other point. I, I think um, the pendulum swung by single-handedly mm -hmm. and a game of that magnitude away from home, I mm -hmm. think he should look back. That is the moment for me you went, that armband fits his arm pretty nicely. Aye. The thing is, we think we things like that, as you without even a goal at the end of it, if there wasn't one, can swing a game. Because look at the game we played against them at the turn of the year, where we started that game brilliantly, and all it took was a bit of fanny and a bit of the back where they got a shot out of it, where Joe Hart like was a terrible pass out from defence, and suddenly oh, everything was up they were suddenly up for it and the momentum of the game changed so it's like even just if a goal doesn't come at the end of it it shows you, it it shows you how game. big these moments are Phil because that is the other side of the coin it's the yep. other side of the coin you got it doesn't need to be a goal as I say we got a goal at the end of that move and yeah deservedly so but mm. as you say that that Joe Hart um, fanning about in the ball moment just mm. br that changed that whole com complexion yep. of that, that football match so it doesn't always necessarily need to be a goal. It can just be moments like that. And as I say, I think Cal Matt will, if we as fans, when we do a nostalgia, we'll probably do another Cal Matt one in another fucking five years. <laughs> probably. A hell of a but lot, lot more content trouble. on it. There'll be a hell of a lot more content on it. But I think Aye. that will be the moment I'll look back on, certainly as go, oh, wow, we've got a live one here as a captain. Do you know what I mean? Like it's now, for anyone who was doubting it, it now all makes sense. It does, it does. Well, one of the things I like to bring up is about Callum McGregor, just to the final moments and just his style of play. I've said this a few times in the bus, but I just love it. And it's something that he's evolved into, what like he did under Ange. Because again, with Ange's style of play for the two years, you know, we were told he only had one style of play and that's how he was always going to do it. Obviously, the whole passing out from the back and that, and, you know, he was always very into that. And McGregor, no matter what pressure we were under from opposition, I always felt he was, he was just such a calm and head and moments of madness, because even the very first game against Rangers under Ange, where we lost 1-0 at Ibrox and Hollander scored that day, and there was points again where we were just under the cosh, but we were still persistently passed out from the back, and I just love that in the trenches, McGregor always shows for the ball, he always finds a bit of space, he's always going to be there, no matter like you know how panicked a player may be on the ball, McGregor will always make himself available, I always found that he's not a guy that makes a run and it's deceptive that it looks like he's involved in the play, but he's actually kind of hiding a wee bit. McGregor always finds himself and makes himself available as a captain should, especially when you're playing that very, you know, high pressure type of football, you know, high risk, high reward as it was under Ange, you know, this passing out for the back. He was always there. And we look at the, the League Cup final uh, earlier in the year when we beat them 2-1 at Hamden and there was points. Now, you know, Morelos got there their consolation goal back. There was a 15-minute spell where we were rattled yeah. and under the course because we dominated that game up to that point. But again, goals can change games. Big moments change games. And he was just such a calm head. Again, there was just points again where they're pressing us at the back. Starfelt, Carter Vickers on the ball. Just pass it short to McGregor. He takes the ball and finds 
somebody else, you know, gets us up the park a wee bit. And I just I just love that sort of way that he's adapted his game, Steve, since uh, obviously under Ange. And I'd imagine that will continue under Brendan. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't now that it's no, part of his game. The, the thing is, you know, Cal McGregor, as we've seen, obviously talking about the goal at Ibrox, where he does that wee burst. He has a wee sort of deceptive burst of pace. But mm. the one thing that he does do, and I said this about many players, He's quick without being necessarily fast, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. He comes, looks for the ball deep, looks for it early, he turns and he threads a pass straight away. So his sort of sharpness of mind speeds the game. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? He's not, having to, he's not picking the ball and carrying it. He doesn't overthink it. He just makes things move really quickly without having to actually expel any energy, which is probably as well how I dare say he can play as many games as he does. Well, he's obviously got a good engine on him. He's obviously fit and he does these wee bursts of pace, as we say. But he's actually quite economical with the ball. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? If you actually look at Cal McGregor with the ball, there's not a lot of buzzing about. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. give me the ball and the, better the ball's gone. Choo, quick pass, gets folk moving. But so, actually, the thing is, see, when he takes in that phone box space, that's what I always compare it to. He controls it. Aye. Two guys are drawn to Cal McGregor because they think... Or he probably does make the team tick, but he's willing to take it. And then, as you say, I'll take it for two seconds. But because mm-hmm. you're all drawn to me, see the the pass that I'll accurately find. Yep. There's a boy over there in acres of space now. Cheers, mate. Yes. Uh, that's that's what makes him special. Do you know what I mean? That yep. was a very loose comparison. Please well, understand, very was- loose. Xavi and Iniesta were the best at they take it in wee phone box yep. space. And the reason you had messes of the world that were just fucking in acres, name mm-hmm. etc., was. You are all drawn to us because you think we're the quarterback. Yeah. But the yeah. beauty of it is we're willing that pressure on because we'll take mm. it in the tight spot and we'll yeah. still find that wee 10-yard ball. I mean, now you've, yeah. lost, you've lost a guy, you know? Yeah. What I hope to see under Rodgers is we're talking about a, a potential evolution, but can his role be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might be going to use the, wrong, the terminology is maybe the wrong way, but hopefully you get what I mean. I want him to become almost more a luxury midfield player. Mm-hmm. Because right now he kind of you know he does do a wee bit of hard work. He's hustling down. He's getting the ball and stuff. But I want him to be beside someone that does all that, so he doesn't even need to get involved in that. I literally want to be a luxury player. I just want to be the guy that unpicks a lot. Give me the ball and it's away. Do you know what I mean? Do less but contribute more because I don't mm-hmm. think. Atty really has that side to his game. Atati's a very, you know, again, he's quite energetic and high energy and he plays the risky passes. But he never, I don't think he's quite down and dirty. The tackling side of that midfield battle, there's Agreed. a wee bit of things that, you know, McGregor's having to get involved in that. I Is want this the power? Less of that. Do you know Is what I mean? this the power, Steve-O? Is this the power that Jenk Rogers is talking about? He's going, his vision of Carl McGregor, he'll be like, that can't be the guy who's the 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 winning ball like the winning the ball winning midfielder. Sorry, the winning yeah. ball midfielder. The ball winning <laughs> midfielder. He's going. That's when he's maybe talking about that power gap. Like he mm-hmm. sees, he's going. That's what we look for. We need more power in the team. And he's yeah. kind of identified that, and he said it in pretty much layman terms. I want stronger guys in that team, and I think it's because you're right. Come back. He's going. No, 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 no. I think he's far, far got too many skills. Too much mm. to bring to the table with the football than him being the guy doing that dirty work as well. Yes, he's capable of it, but why not play your strengths? There's someone in there who can go, and again, it'll be a Bruni that he's talking about. Do you know what I mean? But maybe, no. maybe a more technically gifted Bruni, we might be looking at Brendan identifying. Well, and, and that's the thing again, listen, it's just a name that's been popped out there, and I know nothing. I'm not going to sit here and pretend, but for example, say, let's just say hypothetically, it was the Swiss boy. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you see, I mean, he seems to be quite robust in the tackle. I yep. think that's what we need. We need something. We need a we need a kind of younger version of Scott Brown. You know, a hard ball winning. But, he, you know, anybody that Brendan Rodgers brings in, much like Postacoglu, they'll need to play football. They'll need to have that all-round football and ability. He's not just going to get, you Does know, he play the for do you know what I mean? He's not going to go for that. That's not going to wash. And I think we, I think we almost settled when we were talking about wanting a, a number six or a holding midfielder. We almost settled for just somebody that can be hard and maybe pass. Yeah. I think he's going to look for an elite level player. That could be someone he's worked with before, maybe at Leicester. Mm-hmm. Somebody. Maybe <laughs> 
could be some down uh, to, to left field, you know, like this mm-hmm. Swiss boy, but I think that's what he needs. It'll be interesting again to see how that develops in midfield because, as I say, Hatati mm-hmm. has many good qualities, but he's again, he's almost like he's caught your compensating with having Hatati in there because he doesn't quite do what you want him to do with that tackling thing. He's kind of similar to. McGregor, but you get that wee bit more exuberance about him. But you want somebody that just, you know, sits and then that... I think it'll, I think it'll be yeah. McDominay that you'll ask the question about. Yeah, you'll probably see think you will. I, you'll probably see more of the benefits, as I say, is it just the passing and making things happen for McGregor. But he'll just, he'll throw a ball, a peacock with the chest out, and he'll just speed the passes, do you know what I mean? I think, I think it's different because it's different eyes, isn't it? Because I think Rogers will look, and he will whether he wants to admit it or not, and he'll say the past is the past, but he'll be looking at Calmac going, whoa, you're not number... What happened? You were number <laughs> 10. How the fuck are you dropped? Not even eight to, to six. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck? You can't be number... No, 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 no. We, we, we'll, wait, we'll get a number six in, and trust me, you'll be either eight or 10. And if you have maybe, because mm. you've done 30, maybe eight suits you better, that's fine. But there's mm. no way you're my number six. I'm what, I generally think... Rogers will be asking questions of players we'll be surprised at. I think yeah. he will mm-hmm. definitely ask a, a different conversation, but I think he's definitely already asked the question about keep tabs on KT. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Keep a keep a note on what his movements are. And if that's not happening, we get him on loan at the end of the window. You fucking mm-hmm. plant that seed and you plant it now. So if it mm-hmm. does turn into a Brighton bidding 20 million for him or 30 million, and look at it, he'll go fuck that, but would rather go to Celtic for a year and then we up yeah. the options. I think that will be on his mind. I think You're... Tony will be the other one. He will well, definitely be saying, "Ask yeah. the fucking question. Who There's is no interested heart. in him? What's his and availability?" I... And that's the thing you were talking earlier on. And listen, by no means we're not comparing these guys. It's like apples and oranges, right? Mm. But I envisage, and McTominay, for example. See if he, McGregor's playing alongside. I'm just using it's just a name to show you. What I mean, a Busquets yeah. guy. Who does all the dirt and shit, right? Yeah. What's that about? He can be that Iniesta that just strolls about and makes yeah. the pass. Do you know what I mean? Totally. That's, I the best, that's the best sort of, obviously, a scale down for Celtic level. Aye, aye. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Kind of, Busquets, Iniesta, Xavi mm. kind of dynamic. Yep. Which we could probably get on a much lower level, obviously, with Hatati, McGregor, and one other. Yep. Like, why? Why do you think? I think as well. McTominay is not as far out, out far mental as people think. A couple of no. things. The Scottish thing. See when he turned down England to play for Scotland. Now, remember, there was an offer now by England at this point. Like, no, no, you come play for us. This was a fifty-fifty at this point. This wasn't yep. only Scotland will play me. Like so many of the other English-speaking. Not English speaking, English accent speaking players we've had. <laughs> right? yeah. We all speak English apparently, but you know, I don't know what language we speak at times. But <laughs> I think that's one... coffee. Well, you know, a couple, couple of games, games here and there, yeah. couple of games, <laughs> there, a couple of games here and there for England as well. <laughs> but I wonder if McTominay's already shown he's not got the airs or graces that the typical EPL sort of youngish midfielder, 25-year-old prima donna has, by choosing Scotland over England, that was already a he's got a few values about him, this guy, in terms of a, a footballing passion, and I think he might be the one who'd be open to the, the move to Celtic, then you've got the other thing and it takes us back to the guy we're talking about tonight yeah. I fucking love playing with him in midfield Yeah, that is, Scott McTominay goes he is my guy I play mm-hmm. better for Scotland for a reason and it's Damn. fucking him. Yes. I think that is a carrot that definitely is part of the the mm-hmm. attraction, if there were one, yep. from McTominay to play for Celtic. Now, of course, Celtic would need to hedge their bets to get a Scott McTominay and just hope that these 25, 30 million pound offers come to fuck all. And yep. McTominay might go, oh, it's fucking Bournemouth, but I'm not interested, mate. Yeah, they can afford me, but I ain't going there. And Man United end up going, well, we've got a situation here where we've got a guy who we're not going to be playing, who wants out, and he's now told us where he wants to go. And I think Cal Mack, who is the show's based on tonight, plays a big part in it because Scott mm-hmm. McTominay, beside Cal McGregor, is a proper machine at work. 
throwing a tatty for the, the fucking yeah. craft yeah. and the guile. And you go, that three here to me is Champions League Celtic level, very much Champions League worthy. I, th- mm. I, th- I think McTominay for me, just I know it's a McGregor show, but just on that, because I, I, so I've been, you guys have been talking about all week and I've been away and stuff, but I think McTominay for me isn't out with the realms. Do we have to? bust the bank, of course we do but the difference being is he's at a crossroads where, you know, he can go to a West Ham and all, yes, indeed, these are these are good teams, right, they're good teams but they're capped, and of course as we've seen with guys like Declan Rice, you can go to a team like that and you can push on, you can get that big move, but mm. he's so young as well in his age and his development, he's got the Man United thing under his belt, he's got the Scotland International thing under his belt mm-hmm. You sign McTominay, you take it at face value. It's probably a, a one-season deal in terms mm-hmm. of we out him. One, maybe two seasons, absolute yep. max. One and a half, right? But you, you front-load that money. You get him in to do what he's doing. He can mm-hmm. win stuff. He can develop. Yep. But unlike any other guys like a Jota, that, there's already EPL teams wanting him. So his value instantly is there. Yep. So the talking about getting 30 million for him or whatever it may be mm. is already, I'd say, inbuilt, such mm. as the demand. He's a, he's a commodity, he's a known up and coming commodity. Yep. He just makes a pit stop to Celtic to mm. shine on a bigger level and win some trophies and then move again, on. I, like again, I go, but I go back to it and I always think, see what, what's fucking funny is. See if you look at Rangers very briefly, how they've managed to get certain players, right? And I'm not talking about McTominay's level, but even EPL players, if you look at the tricks they've played mm. to get guys to go, they've had to force clubs hands. Like Ryan Kent must have basically begged Liverpool, mm. fucking let me go there because that offer was seven million over about six instalments or something. Now they were definitely getting offered five million, six million, seven million up front from other clubs. But a player power when they go, come on, this is where I want to go. It becomes a problem for these clubs and money's not really that big an object to them. Do you know where they go? Do you know what? I think you might be surprised that Mm -hmm. we will have more of an effect than you think. And we've very rarely done that. But Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the examples of, I remember, uh, for example, a very, very tiny one, nowhere near the scale of McTominay. Do you remember Jamie Murphy left Brighton in the Premier League? For yep. one million quid to go to Rangers, and that was in like four installments, purely yeah. because <laughs> he kicked up that much of a fucking fuss that they went, yeah. oh, right, you're desperate to go there, right? Fuck off there then. Uh, but is, do you honestly tell me they couldn't have got two, three, four, five million pounds for him from a championship club? Of course they could, guys. Of course they could have. But the players kind of forced the agenda. We've never seemed to have done that much. I think in the case of both KT and McTominay, we've got different hands we can play. And I don't think we'll be the the first answer. But see if they don't take the first choice or or the the the, the moves that may be apparent and maybe real in front of them don't come to any fruition. I think then those players start angling for that mm. Celtic move, and once they start doing that, the club becomes more receptive to that being the possibility. And I think you'd be surprised if that's not the reason we've not seen a Brendan signing as of yet. But I know it's a Cal Mack show. I definitely well, think Cal Mack is a very attractive factor. And both those guys want to play well, the Celtic team. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up guys like McTominay because I was going to touch briefly before we sort of wrap up the show in maybe like 15 minutes on what's currently going on with Scotland. Because what you said earlier on is true, Russell, in terms of how vital a cog McGregor's become in this Steve Clark Scotland revolution, which is astounding what's going on right now with the national team but when you look at the midfield right now with Scotland I feel like McGregor's in that sort of I would compare it to what Joe Ledley had in the early days at Celtic where he would go about his business quietly where he'd be doing his job really efficiently but he didn't get the headlines because that's what it was like with Ledley early on at Celtic where he didn't seem he was still doing a a efficient job but he didn't get the recognition because McGinn comes with a lot of headlines because he's brilliant and obviously he's so high valued. Billy Gilmore, it feels like if he just completes a pass, the whole of Scotland's just is like, oh my god, Billy Gilmore. I mean, I do think he's a good player, but there are points where you're just like, I don't guys. see it. I still don't uh, see it. 
I'm not having And McTominay's like obviously on the, the best midfield in the world right now under Steve Clark. How has this happened? So it's like all the other midfielders seem to get all the headlines, but McGregor's just quietly there doing his thing, and he's such a vital cog in the machine. And I think in the sort of the usual uh, Steve Clark starting 11 for Scotland, I think McGregor would be the only Celtic player, current Celtic player in the team on the regular and the sort of major starting 11, wouldn't he? Aye. And in fact, in fact, on that, he'd probably be the only SPFL player in the starting 11. Everyone else is in the in England, aren't they? When you think about it, Robertson, Tierney, uh, McTominay, McGinn, aye, Lyndon Dykes, they're all playing down south. So I like McGregor's like the only one from yeah. the Scottish League. But see, it, see, see, when you look at Cool Daddy's point of view here, mm -hmm. we can't no. afford the wages. It's a waste of time talking about the likes of McTominay. See what I don't think people get. See if Callum McGregor played in the EPL. It'd be a waste of time talking about Callum McGregor. <laughs> True, actually. Because, but there's a reason he chooses to play for Celtic, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because of the draw. There is a bigger draw, footballing-wise, to clubs like Celtic than there are other options. This is not as pie in the sky as you think. And my honest belief is Brendan Rodgers has identified both mm -hmm. Katie and McTominay as potential signings for, for, for Celtic. I, I have... Mm -hmm. I'm utterly convinced of that. Utterly yeah. convinced of that. Now, it will not be, well, oh, I bid this club, well, I bid that club. We'll need to play a waiting game on them if there were to come that opportunity. They'll need to be a toing and froing with wages and stuff. But, yes, I, I'm, yeah. I am convinced. See, many guys part, the, want to part of the puzzle he wants to, he wants to get. I mean, not, not to, just to be concise with that. See, we're talking about anybody that we may or may not sign, Right. Wages, yep. Do you know what? Compared to what they're making at this moment in time, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Are Celtic going to go and offer somebody 78 grand? No, they're not. They're not. It's just not going to happen. They might be going to offer somebody 40 grand, 45, mm. maybe up above that for the right player. Mm. Yeah, they could. But that comes down to the player if they want to do it. But I think realistically, any player that Celtic buys, see if Celtic go out and spend above our previous record at Edward, so it's 10 million or plus. Mm. Those are signed, statement signings were short term. They're not being signed, in my opinion, for two and three seasons. They're a impact, get on the ladder, Agreed. spin them on, repeat. Mm. So if Celtic start buying high value players, it's not because that's going to be the norm. It's going to be, get them, in position, one season, whoosh, flip them over, there you go. Because you won't lose money on a guy like McTominay. That's the key point. Mm. Celtic can't afford to pay him 50 grand, let's just say, a fucking... Easy days. Easy can. days can afford it. Even inevitably sell him, they'll make far more than they've got and you'll just be, You know what I mean? That's the that's the difference. And that's the difference between going out and buying a guy that's 8 million that you've never fucking heard of and going mm -hmm. and spending maybe 12, 13 million on a guy like him that you know, pay them handsomely for a season and then moving them on. Steve O, see if we were not talking about Celtic right now, but just X club, and you told if we just discussed how much money they've got in the bank, what they could they afford this on a player, we'd all sit there and go, of course yeah. they could. What are we talking about? Okay, but because guys. of Celtic, we've been conditioned. This is what yeah. don't get. You are conditioned to Lawwell's law. This is the <laughs> maddest thing about Celtic right now. We are all conditioned that we can't do this and there's this ceiling and there's this. No, there's... Listen, this is all within our remit because as you rightfully say, guys. these are guys that could come in and end up being recycled in yep. the yep. transfer market if you are the fluidity and with the aggression that Postecoglou aligned to, we could actually walk away. You could sign a McTominay, have one, two years off him, pay his wages at 60 grand a week and still make profit by the time you sell them on. Well, mate, down this the line, is the reality. Mate. Look down the line, Bellamy, Janino, Gravison, Robbie Keane, they weren't Robbie playing for Keane, yep. Roy Keane. <laughs> Roy Keane. Roy Keane, so it can, not, done. Eh? it can be done, but mm -hmm. fans, it'll be a different level of conditioning, the conditioning will be, these are one season deals, I, I take it as one season minimum, you'll sign them for three, but it's probably going to be one, if you're lucky, two seasons, but, it's to move them on for the bigger money. And That's we will. Because we're going to go, 
They're now going to have played six, eight games in the Champions League. They're valuable in fleet at our mm-hmm. club. So whatever we've spent, whatever our outlay will be, they will go up in value. We'll make the money back on them. I think we need to get away from all this bullshit that I think everyone's feared because Peter Lowell has managed to fucking trick everyone's mm-hmm. mind into going, there's this way to win. See what people forget as well. Genuinely, we never actually went bust after Martin O'Neill spending. Just to remind you, we didn't go bust. In fact, when he left, we signed the likes of Vinegar Hess, like Nakamura, four or five million pound players. The type of fees we still pay now and go, you better hit the ground running. (laughs) That was 16, 17 years ago. We have the same demands of the same fees. It's insane. We're not going to do it with two, three, four players in a pitch. It's just not going to happen. But can we have one, one, maybe two, figurehead winners? Of course we can. Yeah, that's sustainable and achievable. So, you know, that's for another day. But just you know, we're down a wee rabbit hole there. I think we put down the rabbit hole because I genuinely think if we just fucking contrast to compare the guy we're talking about right now, Mm -hmm. Cal Mack is a guy that not just uh, Brendan has said, but Andrew said before. Steve Clark has said these guys. Mm -hmm. Neil Lennon said on numerous occasions. Oh, he's top six English Premier League every day of the week. So how can you afford Callum McGregor? Oh, because he was in situ. That doesn't mean he's he's not got offers or he's not got an agent going, come on, Callum, we can make a lot of money here. What's his draw? His draw is Celtic. He cannot be, he's the only person in the world who goes, I choose Celtic before anything else. There is other guys out there like that. There is other guys that look at playing with a Cal Mac as a very attractive proposition. This shouldn't be fucking rocket science to fold. It shouldn't be something we always, always want as a fan base go, poo-poo it. No, 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 no way. Fucking smile and start being proud of the club we are and go, do you know what? Of course Scott McTominay go, well, I'd start every game at Celtic. Sounds fucking amazing. Sign man, play with Callum McGregor in midfield and play Champions League. Six starts mm-hmm. in the Champions League. I would love that. Combine that with my Scottish sort of cult hero status I've got right now. Wow, mm-hmm. that sounds unbelievable. Why are we the ones, why are we the fan base saying, couldn't do that, oh no, we couldn't do that. <laughs> what the fuck, we're fucking, ro- we'd see if you want to call this a fairy tale. You're fucking, what's your favourite fairy tale? Hansel and Gretel, you bunch of bastards, do you know what I mean? Come on, <laughs> it should be fucking, where's the optimism, man? Oh, Come on, McTominay, pick up the phone, come on, uh, pick I, up that get phone. On get, bus, get, no get on the bus, exactly. Come on, Scott, come on, you so, bastard, 68 I've, on the way to 4K, Scott, come on. <laughs> I've got one last question for you, one last talking point around Callum tonight, because obviously Callum McGregor, say up to now, 20 major honours with the club, eight Scottish premierships, five Scottish Cups, seven League Cups, and many more to come, because he is only 30 after all, current club captain, but looking at from being a homegrown player, somebody that's came through Lennox Town, looking at players that have came through in this century, because Celtic don't, you know, they don't utilise their youth academy as much as they could. We've talked many times about many youth players that have just kind of slipped away and not really got an opportunity. But see how, uh, I'd say, the four big ones this century that have came through, McGeady, Forrest, Tierney, McGregor. Is McGregor the best one out of the four? It's okay to have no as an answer, even though this is a McGregor show. Uh, um, <laughs> I think the most naturally gifted was McGeeding. Yeah. Being completely honest, I think Martin O'Neill did not want to be playing a 16-year-old in McGeeding, but he was too good not to. Mm-hmm. I think McGeeding was a, a, a generational talent that actually just made bad bad career choice. You never went to Sparta at Moscow. Like, no. I think, though, generally Celtic forced his hand on that. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. watched in interviews with him. I watched his open goal one when he talked to Neil Lennon. The first Lennon. 10 million uh, Celtic have been offered for a player uh, and they basically went, you're going there. And he went, uh, <laughs> don't know about that, whereas I think McGeady should have been definitely of target and going mid-table England to begin mm-hmm. with. In fact, yep. top half English Premier League, I think, at that point. Champions League, mate, by the time he was 20, he was the guy we looked for to give the ball to, to carry it. I think mm-hmm. when you look back at those games, he was 20 years old against Milan and stuff and it was like, that's the guy you get the ball to. He can mm-hmm. take on a player. He can bring the team up the park. That was a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. He thrived on it. I think mm-hmm. naturally gifted, he was the best. Uh, KT, best fullback. McGregor's my favourite midfielder yeah. at the lot. <laughs> Who's the other one? James, James Forrest. Forrest. Ach, I'll go to his testimonial and just say, cheers, yeah. James. <laughs> <laughs> fair dues, mate, fair dues. 
for me, it's, like it's hard to balance out, isn't it? It's hard to balance out. You, you can yeah. look at all, all those guys, right, are, are successful, very successful mm-hmm. in their own rights. And, and football evolves and times change. In terms of, you know, there's no doubt that McGregor's coming through recently mm. on the international scene, which is a big, you know, he's performing at a high level. He's putting in good performances in the Champions League. If that continues, then you, I'd say there's a good arguing point for it to be him. Mm. But come back to what Boise says, McGeady was playing against a higher quality opposition in the Champions yeah, League. Yeah. So the measurement stick for him is higher. Yeah. So at that end, you can argue just based on quality, even with this point. And mm-hmm. Rangers and stuff, far better, far, far better standard that he was playing against opposition wise mm-hmm. domestically and, and mm-hmm. Europe. And his team that he got in, Steve O. Yeah. He was and 17. I, I and I, in, yeah. 17 and I, he got into the, the Martin O'Neill team. Exactly. And his more, final season, he was in Martin O'Neill's yeah. team. That is so ridiculous. Everything, aye, everything for McGeady was of a higher quality, higher quality team to break into. Mm-hmm. Regular Champions League football, where he was a go-to guy. The league was fiercer, Rangers were fiercer, but he was still performing. Yeah. So, yeah, do you know what I mean? On face value, you'd probably, you'd probably say McGeady. But, as I said, if we continue on the trajectory that we're on and, you know, McGregor continues to develop on that international level, which McGeady mm-hmm. didn't really do, if we're being honest, mm-hmm. then... Oh, it's a toss up. Right. For me, Tierney is an undoubtedly great player, but until he establishes himself at a, a, a proper team, where that's going to be as on loan for a year and then going on our team, he's kind of a wee bit up in the ether. He's hitting a, he's almost like hitting the bar as a maybe guy. He's had his big move, but it's you know it's been all right for him. I mean, mm. great, all right. Mm. He's maybe making a resurgence, and then he Aye. could be back in the frame. Yeah, fair. No, I say when I looked at the players that have came through the Lennox Town uh, training ground since you know it opened, I was like, one has hundred goals and hundred assists. I know, and he. And I mean, I'm looking. What I mean, a a, record that is. I know. I mean, the only person sport? I've seen so far in the chat, Graham Martin, is the only one that's really put a vote in. But he Forest, has undisputedly, you know? I would say, fourth on the list. Numbers wise, I know, but yeah, assists. you're right. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> mental. If you mental. can get your head around that, fucking hell. I mean. Aidan McGeady obviously was uh, Scottish, then he was Irish, and then you've got... Just like James McCarthy. Just like James <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> I'm not doing oh, it again. Yep. But aye, like, Forrest, um, when you look at that record, I think that's actually a real compliment as well to the players that have came through. I know mm. we look at it always negatively as it's few and far between that have came through that conveyor belt of... But when you actually highlight those four players over the last fucking 15 years, Mm-hmm. You've got to say, like, that's four elite footballers that have been produced. Players. 100 yeah. goals, 100 assists. Celtic's going to go on to be maybe the most successful captain, if not second most successful captain, but overall trophy ranking, mm-hmm. maybe top. Then you go to Aidan McGeady, who was, a, as you say, in an era of real difficulty, was a shining star at, mm-hmm. the, at the top end Champions League was a mainstay of the Celtic team for two, three years, you know, at Europe's top level against far more difficult defenders than you would play against now. Aye. And KT, who was, you know, our record sale, £25 million yep. youth product. So when you compare all four, you've got to be proud of the fact we've produced all of them as well. And whilst we can always take a ne- negative angle at, you know, oh, Celtic bring enough youth players through. Mm-hmm. I look at those four and go, they're shining examples of what a youth system do. And very mm-hmm. rarely do you see in the EPL clubs actually producing a consistent level of players from their youth ranks, if we're yeah. honest. Like, they don't yeah. really, do they? No, no, not really. I think I can I think I can smell a future episode of nostalgia on the Lennox Town legacy, talking about players that have came through. I think that's a topic for the future now, thinking about it. I'm like, there's a few. We could even talk about Stephen McManus and stuff like that as well. We can talk about the other side of the spectrum. But yeah, looking at all those players and the since that training ground opened, uh, who we brought through. So that's one for the future, I think, definitely. I like so, that, Phil. I like yeah. that. See what you said, boys. I think when you look at English teams and stuff, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to prove me wrong, but in my head, obviously, you've got guys like Rashford and things like that, right? But seeing a lot of terms, a lot of Harry the guys, Kane. 
a lot of the guys, who, a, lot, well, a lot of the guys who are that, that come maybe come on to something that become more notable for your system, play these almost peripheral teams and they start out and then they find their way in to another team and build on it. Do you know what I mean? So maybe at the grassroots level with these sort of championship league one teams, they're the building blocks and then the big teams hoover them up and it just looks like they've yeah. developed. Mm-hmm. Do you know yeah, what I mean? That's true. And also I think as well, the other side of it, Steve, well, it's a great point you make. A lot of the guys that, that, that make it when they're coming through the youth ranks at the bigger clubs have to go down the ladder and yep. then pop mm-hmm. back up at a, yep. a different Premier League club uh, yep. at that level. Funnily enough, our manager in situ who remembers who Raheem Sterling was before Brendan Rodgers fucking took Liverpool job? Yeah. Ryan yeah. Sterling is one of the... That good we uh, interview on that, the, 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 the documentary where he buried Steady. some... Steady. <laughs> <show. laughs> What's that? Go on. He buried some, so he says something like... I can't remember. But he says something like Steady, and he's like... Steady oh, on. He uh, pulls him up. <laughs> you were the first plane back home if you speak to me like that again. Well, I didn't say anything, I boss. Him. Yes, you did. That's when Rodgers <laughs> was a wee fat guy, wasn't he? He was a wee fat guy at Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to call him, do you know what I used to call him as well, right? See, we had the pub at the time, so we had like BT Sports, that was, I didn't pay for Sky Sports, for fucking crazy money, right? But I had BT Sports, so they would do like the, the Premier League interviews, you know, like the Premier mm-hmm. League shows, and now yeah. I used to call him the wee pudding. <laughs> so I used to call him, so see when he got the pudding. job. Uh, this is the second time I've went full circle. <laughs> right on Brendan because see then my mate's like you fucking slated him you used to go with the wee pudding all the time I'm like no I always want Brendan to get a Celtic job like <laughs> I was like fucking lion bastard <laughs> so that's like, that's the power of his Jedi mind tricks isn't it <laughs> oh it is it is before we go we'll go back to the trivia from the start of the show if you can remember it but basically it was Ooh. Cal McGregor has an impressive 100% winning record in cup final for Celtic been seven different opponents in those finals. Can you name the seven opponents from the 12 cups that he's lifted up? Mm. Oh, let's get the easy ones out of the way Rangers, yeah. of course, Habs, Hearts, yes, yes. yes, okay, Aberdeen, Aberdeen's a definite, yes, Inverness, Cali Thistle. I was hoping you were going to do what you do on Sutton Death for Jonathan. Yeah, you don't get the recent scene. answer. Not, no, no, yeah. I the, the one that's man. left is the one that I think a lot would forget quite easy. <laughs> I put Dundee United. Uh, it's Dundee United because yeah! it, it was Ronnie yes! Dyla's first yeah! trophy. McGregor Come got on! a winner's medal from that. He didn't play that game because he was on the bench, but he gets a winner's medal automatically. Jonathan Boyce, are you Dundee watching? United. That's yes, you warming up. That's you warming up. Back for like for yeah. death, mate. Oh, I'm That's fucking it. back. I'm back. Oh, Pam, don't you worry. Sutton Death will be back when the Tuesday ticket, the new season starts. Sutton oh, Death will be I'm back. I'm ready this time. This is Paul yes. preseason training. Brendan's yes, touched both sides of my cheek and told me I'm going to be brilliant this year. Like, <laughs> Did he tell you you need to grow a beard as well? Like you, as he said well, to that would be very, very... Real? It'd be very <laughs> difficult if he told me to do that. It'd be quite an awkward question about Brendan. You should just grow out your Weetabix and just... Like, glue them out of your face. Do you think so? I just, I mean, I'm 36 this year. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm used to 36 year old footballers looking old as fuck. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm like, hardly living athletes die and I look younger than you bastards. What the fuck's wrong with these beep tests they do these days? I need a beer test, not a beep test. Oh, you do indeed. But um, that's us, guys. We've done it with two, two hours, seven minutes. That's a Cal McGregor show now wrapped up, folks. So, um, yeah, obviously Celtic are not playing at the moment, so there's no PMP. But what's coming up over the weekend, Boise? Anything planned? Sunday Blairer, obviously. There will be the Sunday Blairer. David can't host because he's planning his wee Florida trip. Well, I say we. I'm jealous as fuck. There's two um, members of the team going on holiday at the same time. Have they I had know, this approved? I know. I know. Yeah, they have. They've signed off and they're both getting paid, by the way, full wages. <laughs> <laughs> have each other approved it? <laughs> yes, but no, no, no. We'll be doing shows over the weekend. We'll do the 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 Sunday brother a couple of games, and I think Sunday night. I uh, yeah, I've got a big day Monday, but I think Sunday evening. You know, we do the old six o'clock slot sometimes, Phil. Sunday sesh. Yes, it's been a while. Well, no, no, no. It's not going to be Sunday sesh. But you and you are going to do the end of season bus stop. We're okay. going to review a wee bit we'll of the. Talk about that for a wee while. We're going to we're going to talk about how the the season's been on the bus. 
Yeah. So better on me successes here now because we are 68 away from the 4K. And uh, I think oh, yeah. it'll be good to, to, to comp on the likes of Steve-O and give a wee bit of recognition to guys who have sure. stepped up time and again. And I think the build up to the Rogers era, I think Steve will doing like three weekday shows just on his holidays. I mean, that's Amazing. how far we've came that you've got guys that's like right. that doing that. So I think we'll be definitely doing a wee bit of reflection on how good the year it's been. And of course, paying tribute to all our contributors because not just the contributors, but the passengers as well. Yeah. And, uh, just kind of saying, like, the bus is the place to be. We've enjoyed ourselves. And then, obviously, like, aligning it with moments that have happened to Celtic throughout the, the sort of past sort of 12 months as well and just how fucking mental this is, this whole thing's been. And uh, I, I think that would be a good time Sunday, uh, Sunday early evening. Sounds good to me, mate. I, that, that sounds like a plan. Love then, to so do we'll that, definitely mate. do that. Yeah, man, we will. Well, I think what that'd be said, there's only one thing left to say. So, uh... Yo, yo, bro, legends. Catch 